Приветствую всех. Hi everybody. We joined our stream science. So uh, it is going to be devoted to practical cases of uh, artificial intelligence uh, application in the business. We are going to talk about the challenges uh, working with data, their protection, deep fake synthesis and uh, speech recognition and also protection of uh, vo voice um, uh, biometry and also we'll discuss as how all the above um, can improve business processes. Let's start with the statement of Boris Robinovich, senior uh, director um, data um, management. Um, he's going is Bear, is Bear Bank. He's going to talk about artificial intelligence uh, tasks, why we need it, and uh, what um, issues uh, it can solve. So Boris, the floor is yours. So, hi everybody, um, Globetrotters, uh, my name is um, uh, Boris Urbinovich, I'm CDO of Sbeer Group. I'm going to talk today with you as to uh, something similar to the reality, but not the reality about the synth synthesis and uh, what problems or what issues our AI community has. Um, that's a problem of convenient working with data from any location, from the office or your home. And of course, there are limitations related to sensitive data um, uh, operations, and to li eliminate them, uh, different methods and ways uh, are invented. Today, we're going to talk about um, um, computing, um, uh, and thus uh, we can improve the accessibility of data and allow uh, our um, employees to work with uh, sensitive data um, as um, as if, um, but um, not in reality. So um, that's related to clients and personal data um, in unprotected um, environment, machine learning, and also to uh, combine uh, several confidential or uh, data sets, um, uh, which uh, are a commercial um, secrets. Um, what um, algorithms? It's a homomorphic um, uh, encryption uh, when we use it on the one side, and then using the encrypted data somewhere else in some other location, and also returning the data back. It's uh, decrypting um, by the um, customer, and the synthesis of data and um, uh, hardware and computing when all those transformations are done using the special processes, uh, specially created for the purpose. Uh, thus, you can guarantee that a human being cannot touch the data because it is all uh, at the hardware level. And in personification, it's, um, I don't remember that uh, this word, but uh, it means that um, working with the data sets, um, uh, uh, we uh, identify special errors, uh, which um, shows that you cannot um, uh, trust the data 100%. They might be fake. And classical impersonification, when we uh, change or replace some of the data sets using algorithms. Um, a lot um, of vendors uh, operate uh, um, and libraries operate in this uh, field, both in Russia and abroad. And um, that's what we're going to talk about, uh, pros and cons of those uh, uh, methods. It's homomorphic encryption. Of course, there are uh, pros uh, because by the end of the day, uh, they, uh, privacy and confidential computing is provided. When you guarantee what the uh, um, input data, banking secrets, uh, or personal data are protected, and um, but this method, of course, uh, has a, a great um, um, negative uh, element. Um, well, the speed um, uh, goes down uh, 1,000 times uh, um, against uh, working with input data. And of course, that's exactly uh, which is not okay with us uh, in Sberbank with huge masses of data. Data, and those algorithms are very specific for each uh, ca a group of cases. So you have to, uh, to invent uh, um, their own of uh, encryption and decoding. We are going to talk about synthesis later and uh, the hardware uh, solutions. First of all, from the point of view of uh, security, we find um, uh, vulnerabilities um, at uh, the hardware level, and where 
we can, for instance, uh, load um, some data. So this, of course, happens. Uh, the transfer of personal data does happen from one environment to another. And uh, of course, you require um, consent uh, for uh, to process it. Uh, quite um, uh, specific um, things. It's um, uh, computing. It's a special uh, complexes. Of course, uh, they cost a lot of money. And uh, again, uh, there's some specifics uh, from case to case. Uh, they're different. And Winsbear uh, decided uh, after comparing all those algorithms to focus more on the synthesis of data. And I am going to talk now about what it all means. That's a program data generation, which is used in applications. And the essence of it is that we take uh, the uh, um, uh, input, the original data set, with all personal data, banking uh, secrets, and whatever secrets uh, there are. And based on them, we make up a model, which then generates similar data, similar to the input data. Uh, and the peculiarity is, there is that you can guarantee thus uh, both uh, the, um, the sense of it and uh, the connection between the data and uh, the distribution um, between them. And I will show you a simple example uh, for you to better understand and to have a better idea of what it means. So this, uh, um, um, input data sets. It's uh, just simple for lines, but still you uh, can see some distribution, some peculiarities, and some personal data. And uh, what uh, our models can do um, is they t uh, are trained using this um, um, data set and they uh, can see what kind of connections and ties between and what meanings uh, the different parameters or indicators can acquire. And then the model can generate a data set uh, which, is, uh, which will be maximally similar to the, um, um, to the initial and you can do similar operations uh, developing and training models uh, and and uh, research, uh, for instance, if um, uh, it's about um, uh, doing some analysis or research around um, uh, stochastic um, using big masses um, uh, of data, and then next uh, you will work with this data set. So we called um, our component, which generates uh, those synthetic data, uh, synth data. It's uh, our program uh, complex. Uh, we embed uh, different internal instruments in, and the purpose of it is uh, to do what I've just told you about, uh, based on uh, the uh, input data set to uh, further generate similar synthetic data set, which uh, will allow us um, to um, for data, uh, data scientists and engineers to work from home, uh, and thus we will not have a risk of personal data leak. How it all operates, uh, so architecture is the basis of it. Then uh, it's, um, we have a library on, uh, based on open source and uh, uh, our ML, ML our own uh, developments of our Asbury AI and the library which allows us uh, to um, uh, uh, replace or, um, data sci scientists um, uh, in different uh, parameters or um, uh, logos. Then uh, you can see those hives of architecture which is related to uh, generative uh, new network and this all allows um, uh, us in all this in the um, uh, sort of uh, the cover that you can see in the um, uh, uh, right part of our material um, it's uh, access right uh, managing or controlling into client data and also working with um, uh, storage of metadata met um, uh, with big masses of data and uh, controlling and managing those um, flows and this front end here which uh, is um, uh, trying to maximally comfortably prepare this data set with synthetic uh, data and uh, the back, uh, back end. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about, uh, about it later. So what we've achieved here. So for you to have an idea of why uh, and what it is and how to prove to our customers that that's exactly what you should invest in and work with. Needless to say that initially we um, um, uh, took uh, uh, the accessible data set or available data set to show that the quality of uh, operation of work in uh, um, and uh, the in initial and synthetic data set allows us to conclu conclude that um, uh, data uh, data scientists can freely work with the synthetic data and you can see that um, working with model with initial data set uh, and uh, rock out with and uh, that uh, the deliverable we um, had at the synthetic data uh, you can see that um, uh, it's only the third sign after uh, the common and so the accuracy is uh, fantastic. And there are some other algorithms.
algorithms um, and other solutions, uh, the most popular of them is, and the most effective uh, in the market is uh, mostly AI, which uh, showed uh, even uh, lower result in our model. But that's not it, of course, and it's clear that uh, uh, Titanic data set was not enough, and we decided to go further uh, to take on board the regression um, um, task, and we tried to um, uh, take the data set um, on insurance companies and on um, uh, reimbursements, and so we then trained uh, the model using this data set that we generated synthetic data and then compared it with the initial one. The result was a little bit worse, but nevertheless, uh, the total conclusion of the respected community of data scientists um, was that that's uh, exactly what they can use in their work. And um, of course, uh, you can do it from home, uh, the main um, um, chunk of work, but if you need some super ch um, uh, tuning, um, uh, you can um, uh, do it, for instance, say, in some separate environment with personal data, for instance, to be to fine-tune the model in a more accurate way. And you can see here that the result of the work of this model is comparable um, uh, using uh, synthetic data with original data, and you cannot uh, say that it, it, uh, you cannot use it. So uh, how to um, I understand that the quality of work, or even not work, uh, the quality of data set that you generated is similar or comparable with the original. There are different methods to do it, and we use our internal methods uh, inside, we develop it inside um, uh, um, the model um, to, to fine tune, and some external, uh, of course, um, and correlation of uh, connections. So the first task is to show that um, the geography um, uh, is very similar to the original, and the second uh, at the level of the um, connections and um, uh, indicators of um, different parameters to show that the synthetic data set is maximally similar. And the picture, uh, we, we can uh, we now have two indicators, the balance and um, the income. So just to show that in one data set you can have uh, different indicators, and uh, we have generated uh, both and the distribution uh, by indicators and you can see in the comes that uh, uh, the initial, the original parameter of the indicator uh, and what was generated. Uh, so that's the result. And you can see uh, that it doesn't um, differ much for users, for external um, uh, verification. Uh, that's uh, qu quite a valid thing. But there are internal methods we use in the process of data generation where we can verify that we guarantee that um, the original data distribution is uh, performed and um, uh, you can see them on the screen. That's not uh, all. That, uh, there's another set of metrics uh, related to uh, personal data, identifiers, uh, security. And the key thing here, uh, the key question of uh, cyber uh, security guys, how can you guarantee that the personal uh, data um, uh, not um, uh, um, matches? And, and we have special set of algorithms. I'm going to talk about its personal data definition and identity identification in the data set and the generation, and then at the end we compare to guarantee that uh, they are not um, cross each other, uh, that um, no personal data from uh, initial data set uh, would um, cross uh, those uh, synthetically generated. Only That's only part of it. There are some other metrics and the guarantee that uh, we uh, will not double the correlations, 100% uh, correlations that inside the groups we don't have 100% distribution um, uh, and we can um, and this guarantee uh, guarantees that um, uh, it will 100% um, not be similar to the original so how would we do it is uh, so data set is given then on the one hand is personal data profiling then the analysis of the structure of the data to uh, have an idea of what should be generated based on that then on the one hand you prepare the data for further generation um, at the upper part you can see in the model, it um, uh, generates, the model generates uh, uh, the necessary data set, um, uh, not in personal uh, data or sensitive data. Then um, it goes to uh, the initial structure, and then parallelly you uh, work with uh, generating personal data. So then you combine it all, and then um, the total data set with synthetic data, um, and then it gives you the report as to how um, high quality the report was. Um, and and uh, whether there are some crossings where 
that uh, um, personal data. So that's using the architecture I showed you, using the F uh, uh, FTML development we had. And at the end, I wanted to show you as to how it looks. Um, uh, just uh, look at the screen. So synthetic data opens up new opportunities in developing products, uh, research, uh, training models uh, of um, artificial intelligence. They do not uh, have uh, commercial information or personal data and uh, keep uh, the dependencies uh, between attributes inside the database and reproduces uh, similar data. So to get the synthetic data, you have to load an example of real data, fine tune the parameters of generation and launch the task. For instance, online shop wants to um, um, uh, an uh, outsource team to develop new programs so you have to give them an access but uh, uh, not disclosing the information about the clients and purchases their purchases we set up the uh, task for synthetic data uh, for the team to train the model you will have to get an example of real data so we put the parameters uh, using the protected channel then now uh, we put uh, the necessary data of lines on the uh, personal data of clients and their purchases. Then at uh, the profiling, then the model analyzes the algorithms um, of sensitive data and the user can manually uh, adjust uh, um, the generated data. For instance, if uh, you see the uh, sensitive information in this field, it can be synthesized in a voluntary text or uh, FTML model into, um, uh, um, in, into a comment. And, when, um, and then you uh, launch the process of uh, training this generation and the user gets synthetic data in, um, uh, you, uh, in a, a zip archive and synthetic data you can uh, verify in uh, the generation uh, reports. Then you can see the percentage of crossing with initial data and personal data and also the matrix to verify the similarity. The synthetic data is ready to use. Uh, also the data for training can um, be loaded through interface in, into the files uh, to uh, see the correlation between them. So the data that's visually down um, doesn't change um, uh, very much of the initial and keeps uh, uh, the connections between the tables. Well, to recap, uh, folks, um, you've uh, seen um, uh, the example. Well, uh, m this uh, story impresses me very much, and I uh, will tell you how we're going to uh, use it. Um, of course, it's uh, verifying the hypothesis. Uh, before launching um, some industrial processes, you have to first verify whether it makes sense to work with this data set in the first place. And you uh, can uh, generate uh, using our um, instrument and then um, go. Uh, go on. But if you uh, lack some data, you can generate something similar, which will not um, uh, copy um, the original, but will be very sim sim uh, similar. Then expanding some data sets, we can add uh, based on the industrial uh, cases. And as I said at the beginning, that's remote work uh, for, of data scientists. Um, and at the end, uh, well, clear enough, uh, we uh, uh, have our own roadmap to further develop the product, uh, generating text, uh, images, um, and if you uh, see and if you have some ideas, if you want uh, to, to test something, so here is uh, the uh, QR code, it's, it's the link, and you can uh, go and ask uh, there and ask the questions uh, of our team. Thank you very much. Uh, see you. Okay, thank you very much, Boris. The next speaker is Dennis Dimitrov, um, Executive Director of uh, Sber AI Data Analysis, Data Research, uh, Artificial um, uh, intelligence IURI Institute. He's going to talk about a research project on multimodal and multitask um, uh, training. So, Dennis, we are ready for you. Здравствуйте. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Denis uh, Dimitrov, and I'm uh, head of uh, Fusion Brain um, in IREM. So the project is devoted to multimodal and multitask training. 
Well, a couple of introductory words as to why we need this uh, project in the Artificial Intelligence Institute and SBER um, for that matter. So the first observation, um, uh, trivial as it might be, uh, that um, we want to do something similar to a human being in some sense uh, to make a step uh, to a stronger artificial intelligence. So what are the features, the main features of the human being? Multimodality and multitasking. And it's um, known that uh, from birth um, uh, there are um, uh, some um, different feelings uh, and uh, you can, um, a human being can solve different tasks. Uh, and neural networks um, uh, do not know how to do it in the majority of cases, uh, especially classical ones. They, solved, uh, they can solve only one task with one type of date. Uh, and certainly they do it more effectively and faster and more high quality than a human being. But the approach is not scalable. And if we want to teach or to train this neural network to do another um, thing. So we have to do a new architecture. So you have to understand uh, first what modality is. Of course, there's no clear cut definition. Some uh, humanitarian um, uh, idea or notion, and every group um, interprets it differently. For us, modality is something that you can um, show data in different hierarchic uh, types. So there's a picture, uh, there's a um, uh, um, pixel and vector um, images and some other specific formats and you can uh, uh, you can think about 3D and 2D and so uh, just uh, ordinary pictures and we can um, um, call it uh, one modality. So there are other modalities it's video and uh, it's text and code and in different languages and also uh, certainly there are uh, some other knowledges and um, um, about uh, the connections between objects and that, those are different modalities. Uh, that's what we call them. And the second um, uh, bullet point is that by 2020, we had accumulated certain knowledge, first of all, as to um, how we can treat uh, such difficult tasks. Uh, and secondly, uh, computing resources, uh, GPU and TPU, and also um, uh, and supercomputers um, that, um, well, I mean, uh, what um, uh, can train the models? Actually, we should say that uh, certainly it's a scientific challenge uh, um, to collect such ne uh, newer uh, networks and transformers. I think that's the most popular method currently uh, of approaches to creating such architectures. I mean engineering because the um, number of uh, parameters um, in modern networks uh, is um, growing dramatically. The biggest now is uh, the transformer. Uh, it's language, uh, linguistic, which is M6. It's a Chinese uh, neural network. And clear enough that a big number of um, networks at GPT and uh, DALI-2 and um, well, e Imogen and Party and um, uh, Gato and Multitasking Flamingo and Zber also is not lagging behind, by the way. And um, you can see by the graph uh, our models, Kandinsky, Malevich models that we uh, presented last um, uh, year and, um, and two new models um, that I am presenting uh, in its Rodolfo and Kandinsky 2.0, and we are going to talk about them in more details. And I think that some um, uh, uh, the, the, the hyping the, the, uh, or the, of neural network or a field of neural network um, uh, which um, uh, also and the, the designers well the, they are those uh, which can generate um, pictures uh, by the text um, so for em, uh, Imogen and um, Dali 2 and uh, if um, the totally the text to image task uh, uh, can be called um, unsolved yet um, uh, maybe neural network networks uh, cannot um, uh, achieve it uh, so far um, by piles of examples, uh, but uh, anyhow, the level of quality is um, already superb. Indeed, uh, text-to-image models um, uh, can cope with their task very well, and you can see the examples fully generated by uh, diffusion um, neural networks. And the third observation, um, I mean, why we should do it in the first place, uh, um, a thought that thanks to using such a pre-trained 
contained uh, big fundamental models uh, which uh, can be used uh, for uh, different downstream tasks and using them you can save resources dramatically I mean GPU you manage, when you tra uh, train them to those um, tasks again I should say that that's a desire but of course you can illustrate uh, it, uh, and it, it will become quite clear to the left you can see a classical approach when we create a new model for each new task um, GPU resources uh, here computing resources uh, linearly depend on the number of models we create clear enough with their own ratios uh, the approach uh, using fundamental um, models is uh, that we uh, train one big model one smart big model and all tasks uh, became downstream tasks uh, those uh, separate before and uh, they are solved uh, in, uh, even at uh, fine tuned or um, in fusion or uh, just without training at all and here we spend um, uh, of course a, a lot less uh, lot few resources and um, and to verify it um, uh, to prove it well a journey in 2021 was um, launched uh, which offered this con uh, concept when in the center we had a pre uh, train transformer which used to be GPT-2 at that time and to the uh, left and right um, it's uh, uh, decoders for modality and tasks and the central part stayed uh, single and sort of frozen um, because uh, it um, uh, was trained only by search tasks and were four, um, four tasks uh, were to be solved by this architecture in this si single uh, settled model and you can see from here that uh, there were some text um, uh, image uh, tasks uh, to the left you can see and one for uh, code um, you can but thirdly you can see that fusion brand um, uh, approach where we train uh, tasks uh, uh, totally and of course in a very tricky way not just simply there's their own science as to how to um, um, uh, set up those tasks which help you better quality uh, and uh, time to training uh, uh, of course is much lower as you can see from this table or graph and um, um, so that's about some introductory thoughts and a couple of words about our developments and maybe it makes sense uh, saying that uh, big attention is a uh, um, uh, place to uh, data sets uh, collection of course uh, the linguistic the uh, language um, data set is the most important um, more than 600 gigabytes of Russian text and visual data uh, sets um, uh, picture to image we have more than 350 million in Russian and in English uh, more than 2 billion but the most important thing here is in multimodal research is that we collect um, and fine-tune those um, heterogeneous it's, uh, uh, it's uh, music and graphs and different others trying to use them to train the model needless to say that we create those models but we are trying to create them not just as is but we are trying to uh, achieve some higher efficiency for uh, inference and training and uh, about the second bullet point about creating the model that's what I wanted to talk about uh, so this slide here shows the timeline as to how we have been developing we started with uh, the uh, smart um, or mono model uh, language uh, models and then uh, it's uh, GPT-3 you can see rootifies and you can see them all here uh, so uh, Tanya Shabrina and Sergey Markin uh, teams were doing it and then we switched over to uh, the text image um, task and last year we uh, announced the neural um, network which generates um, um, uh, Malevich which is which were uh, pictures in Russian then it got, uh, then Kandinsky 12 uh, billion of parameters and and this was was done um, by our joint team uh, Sber I and Sber device and uh, then another model that can range uh, the pictures and vice versa and in 2020 we are, uh, 22 we're going to expand the number of modalities ideally we're going to have more than seven the most popular and uh, I think that's exactly the secret model that uh, I show here is exactly the model which is going to be the quintessence I cannot call it now it's going to be the quintessence of our uh, activities and that one of the purposes is to uh, test um, that this saving in downstream task can really be achieved we're going to talk about two models Rudolph well those are the latest models issued uh, in late November and Kandinsky 2.0 diffusion model Rudolph 
itself, in fact, is an outgrow of Root Alley. It's an auto regression model, a transformer, decoder transformer, GDP transformer. Ah, the difference from Root Alley is that on the right hand side we included text tokens. Delhi uh, has the token space in such a manner that they have uh, texts and images, and uh, they learn the two distributions. We went one step forward. We added text tokens to the right. Why? This approach allows us to truly uh, achieve multitasking. DALI can uh, resolve just one problem, that is uh, generation of image based on text, whereas uh, Rudolf can do image captioning. Um, that's a uh, description of what's in the picture. It's RGBG3. That's when we actually model a language uh, using uh, left tokens. And software ranking, another task, and so on and so forth. We have three versions of the model that differ by the number of parameters and uh, the space of uh, tokens. The best model is 2.7 billion parameters. It ranks third in the list. It has more than uh, 300 uh, text tokens, some uh, 24 by 24 image tokens, and 128 uh, tokens on the right. Now, what are those tokens in this case? For text, uh, those are tokens uh, that we obtain after VPN encoding. Image tokens uh, are obtained after uh, spare program coding, and this is something that we talked about already uh, together with uh, Sergey last year. In fact, uh, it's just a background version that uh, learned additionally so that it could uh, code and decode text information in a picture, in the image, uh, and uh, provide uh, better uh, decoding. Uh, it uh, gets 100 on Inception 4 and uh, others. Now, the image tokens are tokens after this very Bokugan uh, coding. Here are parameters of our GPD transformer uh, that, in fact, uh, is learning. Now, uh, how do we do pre-training? Uh, we used pre-task, uh, uh, pre-training. Um, pre the first task is text-to-image, that's Road Alley. Uh, an image should be generated based on uh, text. Uh, then it's image-to-text, it's a reverse task. And finally, text-to-text. That is a language modeling uh, task. Now, the language modeling happened only with the left-hand side tokens. Uh, now, to uh, teach the first two texts, two tasks, we uh, used uh, several hundreds of millions of uh, text pieces. And uh, this slide gives you an idea as to why we have 2.7 million uh, tokens for the right side. We uh, trained language model, and let me explain later why. Let's look at the masks, attention masks. That's 2.7 billion uh, version. The attention mask uh, uses sparse attention uh, applied to an image. When we generate the next image token, we look at all left uh, side text tokens. We look at the row mask, that's uh, call mask. And uh, we'll look at the window around the uh, token, it's a conf mask. Now, when we generate a token on the right, we'll look at all tokens, uh, what this raw is talking about. Now, another specificity is that we intentionally added uh, special tokens that helped uh, code uh, the task better. Now, we introduced special symbols that's uh, related to either text to image or image to text. And uh, we use two tokens uh, prior to left tokens and right tokens. And at pre-training, in 75% of cases, we showed the token, we showed the right uh, task. In 25% uh, uh, percent of cases, we uh, threw in an unknown tokens. So the model learned which task uh, it was supposed to address. It's a very useful feature for fine-tuning. When we want to do fine-tuning, let's say AQA, we can do this. Uh, 
by submitting a uh, question and image on the left side and expecting a response on the right side. In 75% of cases and 25% of cases, we uh, used uh, either known or unknown tokens. And model learns not just to generate correct answers, it learns how to understand a task by coding information in a token. In fact, uh, it's very, very useful uh, for a lot of uh, fine-tuned tasks, and there could be many, many tasks there. I will talk about it later. And at inference, we use unknown tokens, of course, so we don't give any prompts. Now, uh, here are some outcomes of zero-shot performance of Rudolph. And as you can see, image uh, uh, captioning and image painting is something that Rudolph can do. Now, this is a kind of architecture uh, that we uh, applied, and uh, it was uh, presented at the uh, Fusion Brain Challenge. Uh, two modalities were used for texts and for images, uh, 12 tasks. Uh, six tasks were open. Um, the explanation uh, was known, and six uh, tasks were hidden. Now, uh, the participants of the challenge did not see the tasks, but we asked those tasks at uh, the uh, preliminary stage. We used a natural language for each of the tasks. We had this visual QA task, and um, we uh, wanted to get an answer based on uh, the picture and the task text. We also uh, asked to describe uh, by text what's in the picture. Now, to, to understand what uh, the task was all about, those unknown tokens were instrumental. Now, uh, a lot of people participated in the challenge, uh, many teams participated, and uh, our uh, baseline uh, won the third uh, prize. In the future, we plan to continue uh, this uh, uh, topic. We're going to have uh, more than uh, six modalities and more than 125 uh, open tasks and about 50 plus uh, hidden tasks. Now, a couple of words on Kandinsky, my time is running up. Kandinsky is a diffusion model uh, based on the stable diffusion approach. In fact, uh, it's uh, very similar to Python diffusion, but it's multi-language uh, model. It can uh, work with 100, 101 uh, languages, be it Russian, English, or even Persian. Now, one important advantage is that we can use just one prompt containing several languages, so the, gener uh, the model will generate uh, image uh, anyway. It's a classical diffusion uh, model, but it's a layered uh, diffusion uh, based on pixel. and. Uh, uh, based on uh, text embedding, uh, it uh, generates nice uh, image. There are some uh, other parameters, uh, learning parameters, uh, and the uh, final definition is uh, 512 by 512. Here are some examples of uh, the images generated by the model. So the model understands the style and the objects and generates uh, objects better than Kandinsky 1. It was an uh, autoregression uh, model. And uh, obviously, in painting, out painting is another uh, useful feature of this model. That's uh, where diffusion starts. Kandinsky 2.0 can be uh, tested at these uh, websites. Uh, and uh, you can also use Salute, this bear app. In the end, I want to uh, show you this learned cat generated by Kandinsky, uh, by the first order regression Kandinsky. And uh, here, are my, here is my contact information, uh, my email, and uh, please feel free to send me in some questions. Thank you. Denise, thanks a lot. Now let us move on to the discussion of computer vision technologies and uh, high quality synthesis of multimedia content. We're going to talk about deep fakes and let us talk about the ethical side of their creation. We're going to hear about this uh, from Andrei Kuznetsov, Executive Director on uh, Data Research at Bear, uh, AI. Andrei, over to you. Uh, 
Здравствуйте. Hello, I'm Andrei Kuznetsov, and uh, I'm head of uh, projects uh, dealing with uh, computer vision. I'm going to talk about computer vision uh, and uh, high fidelity synthesis of multimedia content. A brief uh, outline of my presentation is as follows. First, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, genesis of the AI generative models. I'm going to talk about Kandinsky model issue this year. I'm going to talk about diffusion models that are gaining uh, popularity and uh, now serve as the basis for a generative AI. I will tell you about our new Natalie model. And uh, as a brief conclusion, I will come up uh, with some takeaways and uh, maybe emphasize the importance and uh, relevance of this uh, whole subject. Uh, up to a certain time, up to, say, 2014, only classical uh, CV uh, tasks uh, were addressed by researchers. By 2016, key uh, research projects uh, concentrated on unimodal architectures. Uh, that's when we saw the first mentionings of uh, image generation based on texts. And since 2017, every single major ML conference uh, would uh, uh, come up with publications and reports on uh, those topics. Now, this is how um, this uh, area uh, evolved. And this is how the various models uh, evolved. Uh, in the right-hand side, at the bottom of the uh, screen, you see a graph. That's the distribution of uh, publications by year between 2016 to 2021. And you see an upward trend. Now, in 2021, the first models appeared um, issued by OpenAI, such as DALI, CLIP, and uh, a model by our Chinese colleagues, uh, Cogweb. In 2021, we came up with two models, Ru Clip and Ru Dali. Ru Dali is a model that uh, helps uh, generate uh, images based on text. And uh, Ru Clip uses a single vector uh, area to address zero shot tasks, such as zero shot classifications. In 2021, this project uh, was the largest computational project in this country. We uh, came up with a huge range of data sets, uh, uh, capitals, and we spent uh, more than uh, 40 million GPU minutes. Our Kandinsky model is a larger version of Rodali, uh, which this year uh, got a new life. We uh, provided additional learning for this model. We uh, did some uh, tests, and this brought the model to the next qualitative level. Here are we see two options uh, for this architecture application. Uh, that is a uh, learning mode and inference mode. Uh, at the learning mode, we come up with a lot of texts and images, and we uh, train uh, this uh, model to generate tokens. So both texts and images are coded by encoding those are shown at the bottom on the left. We use the spare buckle gun for images and for texts. We use uh, BP tokenizer. After that, we uh, train the uh, decoder that allows to predict the next uh, value of the token. Now, once we've uh, trained the model, uh, then at the inference uh, stage, we can uh, input uh, text tokens and we can predict uh, every uh, image token. Uh, those are presented, presented as uh, a grid of uh, image uh, components, and each uh, component is uh, part of the token. Now, this architecture includes uh, tw 12 billion parameters. We used three phases uh, for uh, training and each phase uh, was accompanied by changes in the code base and uh, the mix of uh, the training data set. Now, in the course of uh, our pilot uh, research, our model performed better than any other known model of the same architecture, that is, auto regression architecture. 15.4 uh, using uh, free shade inception distance metric. This is a key metric uh, that the quality of generative uh, models uh, is gauged by. Now, 
you also see performance of diffusion models. Uh, this year, uh, the values are lower. It means that the uh, distribution of the images generated by diffusion models um, is closer to the initial uh, distribution compared to those produced by autoregression models. However, autoregression models in their architecture are not obsolete. They continue to evolve and develop, and there are many new ideas and solutions that we plan to continue uh, addressing in the future to get better outcomes. Now, to gauge the Kandinsky model quality, we did uh, the human relations experiment. In other words, we came up with uh, image uh, sets uh, generated by different models, such as Kandinsky, small root alley model. And uh, we asked our experts uh, which image is more realistic and which image uh, fits the description better. As you can see, a large model with 12 uh, billion parameters, that is Kandinsky model, uh, generated better images uh, for people, and people considered those images more realistic. Here are some generation examples. And uh, you can see how Kandinsky model generates uh, landscapes, uh, cities, uh, individual objects like the armchair, and animals. Now let's move on to the fusion models. This year, two, well, maybe even more uh, than two key models appeared. And uh, these models uh, have very high quality of uh, generation. First is DALI-2. Its architecture is briefly shown here, and uh, there are some uh, generation examples uh, available too. Unlike autoregression architectures, here the image is restored uh, as if from noise uh, completely. Now, uh, by noise, we mean uh, counting value generated by uh, text encoder. The coded uh, image uh, is brought to the prior model, which includes the clip model, and it helps restore a visual uh, vector based on uh, the coded text input. Then at the decoding stage, we get the image, just like you can see here. Now the uh, decoder mode and stochastically generates an image which uh, refers to reverse diffusion process, that is, uh, restoration of the initial image from noise. Now, the visual encoding uh, is shown here uh, based on this new technology, this new approach. We use the glide concept. Uh, the uh, most important features of the original image uh, are extracted uh, through generating the image based on the text encoding. That's, this allows the model to better understand the text and to better generate images. Here are some uh, examples of the generated images based on the uh, input image. At the top, we have the input image, and uh, uh, at the bottom, we have samples uh, that uh, appear in the course of uh, decoding of uh, the uh, text description of uh, the same image. This is what we obtain at the decoding stage. And this is what is uh, done by the reverse diffusion. Now, the other model issued by Google uh, is somewhat different. Uh, it differs from DALI 2. Here we have uh, frozen text encoders that helped improve generation efficiency. The model quality increases uh, in case the text and quarter uh, size increases too. Now, I will uh, talk about this in detail somewhat later. However, I should emphasize that the Google team uh, also showed a special set called Drawbench, which now is considered to be the most sophisticated in terms of uh, generation quality uh, assessment uh, for images based on text descriptions. Now, here is its architecture. Now, the text is uh, input to the uh, frozen text encoder. Uh, T5XXL model is used as the encoder. It comprises about 4.5 uh, 4 billion parameters. And this uh, text embedding uh, that we get after uh, encoding uh, is fed into the diffusion model. The first diffusion model 
turns uh, this text embedding into an image, uh, 64 by 64. The next one, the next stage is uh, increasing resolution to 256 by 256. And the last one uh, brings the resolution up to 1024 by 1024. Now, each stage, and you can see them uh, in the right hand side, the dog picture, uh, at each stage you see how uh, high resolution adds detail to the image. Now, here we uh, give you an example of uh, the drawbench data set that is used to gauge model quality and um, the overall number of uh, prompts, uh, about 200 prompts. It's kind of hard to tell which model is better. Um, some complex prompts are better handled by uh, Imogen model. It is able to better understand the text descriptions. For instance, if I want to generate uh, uh, black apple and green uh, bag, uh, that's what it does for this link to the pre-trained uh, uh, clip model uh, can only uh, produce images that uh, fit uh, the natural colors of either apple or bag. Now, here are uh, some comparisons of uh, Imogen, uh, Dali, and Dali 2, and Glide. And as you can see, Imogen uh, is better than, uh, say, Dali 2. Some generation examples here. And again, you see a very high level of detail. And then let's, let us move on to our model, not Dali model. Uh, now, the uh, basic model is uh, using um, Latin diffusion uh, approach. Now, all the uh, activities happen in the Latin uh, space. We don't generate uh, pixels, we generate uh, coded uh, vectors that have to be decoded at the uh, decoder stage. One other feature that we use is uh, larger size of uh, the UNET model, 1.2 billion parameters, standing thresholding in the course of sampli uh, sampling, and uh, 101 languages. So it means that we can use several languages in one query. Now, this is how we calculate embeddings. Uh, we use not just one, but two uh, uh, models, MT5 and extra clip. Then we uh, fit together the embedding, we send them to layer norm, and then via UNET we get a vector that is decoded uh, by outer encoder. Now, here are some uh, parameters for training of our model and some generation examples. Uh, as you can see, the uh, examples come from different domains. Uh, it's a landscape and some unusual images and stylized images. And again, uh, it can easily pick up uh, different domains, uh, some uh, interesting uh, futuristic uh, images and so on. Now, one interesting and exciting feature is the ability to uh, do in-painting and out-painting. And uh, based on this technology, we can think of several user uses of this model. For instance, we can employ it to restore uh, cultural heritage sites. So using its uh, knowledge, uh, the uh, network can recreate uh, a site or uh, can recreate some artifacts and relics based on um, historic uh, events and styles and respective knowledge. Anthropological reconstruction, another very useful uh, application. Uh, for diffusion models. Industrial design, uh, here we can come up with uh, exciting designs uh, for uh, some products and uh, something that we can use to automate the processes or reduce weight, uh, which may result in uh, fuel savings and reduction of CO2 emissions. This is something that could be uh, applied to car manufacturing and aerospace industry. Now, in conclusion, a few words uh, on the following. Now, our world today tends to pay, uh, pay a lot of attention to diffusion models and uh, uh, generative AI. And this is uh, what uh, designers, architects, and artists do. They can use diffusion models to come up with studies, uh, initial images, and then uh, carry them to various applications to generate, say, 3D objects and uh, one example is shown here. 
Now, there are stock uh, image sites uh, where you can do your search for a specific image or you can generate an image. And there are different plugins uh, for uh, image editing and image processing. Uh, these come out very often, and there are many of those, and uh, we have a plethora of uh, those plugins. Uh, in uh, the uh, software market. Now, in conclusion, uh, this uh, is a very promising area, and uh, we understand uh, where it is moving. We know of possible uses, and I think and I hope that the cases I've described will continue to uh, be addressed and developed in the future by us and other researchers, which will generate very um, many new users and applications in the future. Thanks a lot. Andre, thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you for a very insightful presentation. And now let us hear from Alena Drobyshevskaya, Senior Product Manager of AI Cloud, a provider of uh, cloud technologies. She will tell us how to arrange uh, a joint project by data science team uh, if, say, uh, outcomes of uh, ML cannot be put to uh, the cloud, the public cloud. Hi, everybody. I'm Elena Drobyshevskaya, and I'm uh, uh, AI Cloud uh, Senior Product Manager. Let's talk about AI Cloud, uh, ML uh, platform. It operates in the cloud, but could also be done at uh, the private hub. Why this platform? What kind of tasks it can address? Uh, what are specific features we can observe in this whole business? And how we can think about a cloud solution? And how can uh, and when we can think of uh, using this uh, platform in the private hub? And finally, let's talk about the advantages of our platform. Now, why we should think about such platforms in the first place? Uh, models operationalization uh, age uh, has come. In the ML domain, we see a, a huge surge of the number of um, AI teams. Uh, we see increasingly complicated and sophisticated interactions, um, projects, uh, linkages, and so on. Uh, time to markets uh, tends to decrease dramatically. Previously, uh, months and uh, even years uh, may pass. And in the past, uh, but now uh, it takes months, literally, or sometimes even hours matter. Now, uh, the greater the volume, the more resources we need and uh, the more efficient we're supposed to be in terms of uh, computational uh, power. We also should think about people. Well, obviously, the situation in the market is much better now. We have more data analysts, uh, data engineers, data scientists available. But still, sometimes we experience shortage of uh, such you know, professionals. And finally, when we uh, move from pilot to uh, off-the-shelf uh, solution, we understand that operationalization uh, processes uh, become crucial. Now, uh, let's uh, look at what ML Ops uh, is available. This is something that is very much in vogue today, but in the ML Op market, we have about 300 different tools and solutions, and the majority of those are open source. And uh, you know, with open source solutions and startups, you never know how long they will. Uh, managing the market, whether a community uh, buy in or not, whether they die out or carry on, it's kind of hard to pick uh, something for you. Now, in the Russian markets, the situation gets aggravated by the fact that uh, quite a few major players uh, pulled out. And uh, even if solutions uh, had been introdu introduced, uh, support uh, would no longer be available. It's not quite clear what, it sh what should be done in this respect. Now, open source is not a silver bullet either, so open source solutions should also be developed, and they also encounter some issues and have to be supported. And when we move from solutions to models, per se, to experiments and to fully operational models, we realize it's fine. Look, we have this. Uh, 
solutions layer, technology uh, platform layer, but the model is supposed to live on, it's supposed to evolve and should provide necessary uh, precision. Uh, for it to work um, well. So if uh, the process um, is violated, then uh, the use of it will go down to zero. Well, if we uh, dig deeper and if we uh see, uh, for instance, um, at the ML process that has been built uh, already. For instance, we are in the uh, cloud and did some experiments and that's a very frequent scenario. Even bigger companies uh, start doing it in clouds because it's easy and then we say, okay, cloud is good, but you cannot use this infrastructure all the time. So there are some federal uh, legislation and industrial standards that regulate this operation. So uh, that's um, a fact of our internal procedure. Uh, public um, uh, decisions uh, can be limited by functionality, not providing some features or functionalities or functional capabilities. And under current conditions, unfortunately, the situation is a such that the main uh, cloud um, uh, players have left the Russian market and there are no solutions. Uh, so, And it's also very difficult with companies because very few companies with uh, all built, well built up ML process and uh, the maturity level is not always very high. And um, digging deeper into the details, uh, there are um, the challenges inside as to how we're going to redistribute the resources, as to how to allocate how many resources to this or that group, and how we are going to calculate the real uh, expenses and how we are going to allocate them on the business or on IT who's going to provide continuous work up for the system. So there are so many questions uh, from um, the business to IT system and there are more and more of them. So here uh, the, um, we, we uh, reflected and made this ML space decision, a solution which is an iCloud. Um, it's a platform of full cycle ML development. Initially it was based on the supercomputer Cristofari. Cristofari 1 and then Christ Safari uh, second now and then added uh, not only supercomputers but um, a GPU and um, uh, other uh, CPU resources, simple resources. But that's just a technological platform which provides you an opportunity of joint work um, of data science um, uh, teams. Uh, the important difference is that it can uh, operate in uh, in cloud. That's the main principle. It um, in uh, it also can be installed uh, on prem in um, the contour of the con uh, con uh, customer. That that's um, our Russian development. We did it um, three years ago, and it's uh, registered in the register of uh, IRM by Ross Patent uh, of uh, software programs. It's a cloud solution compliant to all requirements of uh, federal law 152 and data protection. Talking about this ecosystem and what it has, and um, uh, that's the platform uh, with more than 2,500 users, uh, more than 25,000 launched and trained models, more than 2.5 thousand uh, gigabyte a year, so that's a platform which allows our customers to reduce uh, the um, uh, time of cy cycle of ML development and time to market, um, uh, which is also very important and quite a cool thing. When you can see that you live the story with your customer and you can see that how from the experiment uh, guys did uh, just yesterday in their test contour, in uh, several weeks or even uh, several days uh, they uh, have uh, a solution in the prod, uh, issuing recommendations to uh, the users, uh, processes um, uh, video, sound and images, so that's um, uh, great and when you can see that numbers are transferred into operating business. What are the interesting and useful features of um, uh, ML platform? Well, because initially we were based uh, in the supercomputers, we were in the paradigm of providing access to the whole big team of data scientists uh, who uh, were developing uh, this model. So it was at the paradigm of full cycle of ML. So we uh, launched the, we load the data, we train the, the model, then IP services, we, um, and, and then we we'll put it into prod. So, since all those resources are put as layers and they're very difficult, complicated, a lot of attention was paid to how those queues uh, um, of um, task distribution are operating. And we uh, try to utilize uh, the most effectively 100% utilization of some of the clusters and regions uh, of those processes. And same uh, will be uh, the case with um, the, uh, the customer, because um, as for the functionality that's um, distributed, um, 
uh, training its data set of models and services. And interestingly, that's um, uh, very interesting for our industrial um, customers and uh, because that's a platform, but uh, with ready-made framework and libraries, uh, which uh, are pre-installed and allows you to start operating fast. And the fast generation of IP um, uh, to the model developed um, the, of um, different containers. So we uh, actually use uh, CPU and GPU and different other manufacturers, and, and uh, that's important when we uh, go um, from cloud to on-prem because everybody has different uh, types of resources, important um, uh, for the platform to allow to work with them. Not only GPU, there is uh, some other in recommendation models. Uh, there are some other important things besides um, mechanism of uh, smart queues and effective utilization of resources and mechanism of uh, limits and limitations and quotas for projects which allow you to accurately allocate um, resources and teams uh, and actually talk um, at uh, the level of administrator as to when and how many resources to allocate. Who needs such a uh, platform and such a solution? Where's the highest interest? Uh, well, if at all, yes, there is. Uh, this year we can see a lot of attention is paid, uh, paid to this platform uh, by banks, uh, finances, industry industry, heavy industry, oil and gas, and uh, petrochemicals, uh, power, and the public sector, of course. Oh, well, uh, essentially, not uh, only those industries can be the focus when, uh, for the um, on-premise, but any client, any customer, any company with um, a sufficient number of their on-prem resources, and they, for instance, understand that they do have resources, now they have to develop a platform or take on board some ready-made, not to um, spend time uh, on uh, the development. What are the emails uh, private? Um, well, of course, it's integration with business systems because we have to take all those data based on which the models are built. Not only business systems, uh, but corporate um, storage um, um, facilities and embedding into the existing landscape of the companies in all senses, information security. Importantly, is that the system is embedded in different levels. Uh, there's IP level and integration level level uh, for the system and this way have been gone by us and we do have examples um, of um, embedding into the contour of the customers where we had uh, both uh, the billing integration system and internal filing systems and disks of uh, databases and integration of um, uh, their own uh, services of uh, uh, users authentication and embedding into the information landscape. When uh, we um, um looking at why this is needed, the system, uh, it was um, curious to talk to those who started to implement um, uh, based on the open source companies. Uh, talk to uh, many big companies uh, saying, do you have a solution? Yes. Is it okay? Yes. More or less uh, functionality is okay. What are your issues? The main issue, they um, named several customers from different industries that um, uh, they don't know how to effectively utilize the resources. Everything is fine-tuned, built up uh, as a process, and all the teams have an access. But on the one hand, it so happens that the teams uh, have queues um, to get an access to the resources and train their models. But on the other, paradoxically, when IT specialists uh, look at uh, the uh, resources um, loading, and they can see that it's minimal, the, the numbers they quoted, uh, 5 to 8 percent only, the utilization of the resources they have. Uh, there, um, compared to what uh, they say internationally, uh, well, it, that's approximately the same uh, numbers they quote. Um, just looked up uh, some uh, um, questionnaires of users around the world. 17% of companies uh, uh, fail to utilize the resources. 22% of companies say that they are idle. And 42% of companies say that there are issues with different capacities. Well, nevertheless, the hybrid uh, um, can be helpful here. And when you don't have uh, sufficient resources, a hybrid or a public cloud, uh, and we have made up a che the checklist. I'm not going to read it out. You can look up and get the presentation after to get some details. So, well, totally the main factors um, now to look up and start your work not in the cloud but on-prem is um, uh, if you have, uh, let's 
legislative limitations or if uh, there's an the infrastructure deficit or at the level of the company, for instance, to work with a certain type of data. And if uh, there's unequal um, loading, uh, very characteristic of some types of solutions or tasks when uh, some tasks require big capacities uh, to train, characteristic only uh, of training, but for operations, uh, they don't need such resources and not to overpay and um, not to have uh, infrastructure you uh, don't need. Maybe it's um, easier to train in uh, the cloud and then uh, take on board um, on prem on premises. So uh, and um, it is it, it becomes very positive positive because uh, you are operating in the single environment and it's easy for you to get it from the cloud and put it on premises and train your model using your uh, closed um, data set. So this combination, this hybrid, and if you look at the international uh, global experience, uh, it happens very often all over the world. About 70% of companies uh, do exactly this thing. As a rule, they uh, put the test in the cloud, or demo, or uh, the contour, contour that uh, requires some um, uh, big data um, processing, and then the uh, models um, are taken over to the contour of the company to continue the work. Very often, they do use combinations of these two infrastructures. Well, actually, what um, can be offered here um, or suggested? Uh, start with cloud. ML version is uh, um, available um, for, uh, well, the only limitation is that this product is designed only for legal entities, for companies. Physical entities, unfortunately, do not have an opportunity to get an access to it. Uh, but QR code, uh, nevertheless, is still here. If you want information about our product, and uh, you can get in, uh, in touch, and we will tell you the whole information and give you an opportunity to test it in the cloud. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Elena. Um, we will move on. Uh, Alexey Klimov, technical leader at uh, Cloud, he's going to talk about the uh, talk about the platform uh, for full cycle machine learning and uh, work of the data science, scientist team. Alexey, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. My name is Alexei Klim. Which is for the users um, to conveniently uh, train um, uh, the big tasks and the big data and about issues and problems and what ways there are to um, get rid of problems. What is ML Space? Uh, it's a platform, a full cycle, um, uh, a separate data scientists or a team of data scientists can operate in uh, all um, uh, uh, it, they can do inference models and um, exp in the, this integrated uh, environment and also this platform is available both in cloud and um, to um, put it on premise uh, into the contour of the customer we are proud to say that it's uh, local development and we are proud to um, present it ML space uh, uh, use it um, uh, used uh, Christafari and Christafari now now and you can see uh, the ratings uh, in the, the um, top 500 uh, top computers of the world. And this, the, those resources are, are very good um, and very helpful to train big models um, um, for, uh, the, uh, for to um, train them fast um, uh, to uh, increase ta time to, um, uh, to reduce time to market. So now, now let's talk about what big tasks uh, mean and how you can um, identify them, how you can define them. So uh, several parameters here on the slide. First, it's um, hardware requirements, mm, then uh, uh, the resources uh, that uh, used to train. Mm, uh, more often, uh, that's uh, when it is large scale, mm, that's a big number of servers, uh, each of which uh, is equipped with big uh, amount of uh, memory, operative, and big uh, number of processors. And in our case, we also providing uh, the most powerful video cards for GPU accelerator to um, train neural uh, networks. Um, very often uh, you use uh, big data sets um, to, to train. Uh, um, here we are talking about uh, hundreds of uh, gigabytes and terabytes of data. 
And the third parameter, uh, which we put here in our list, uh, is actually when uh, the model is uh, um, uh, to be uh, trained uh, latency. Well, I mean, when um, uh, it's in the inference, we wanted to process um, requests very fast. Um, and um, uh, so it, um, uh, so this model um, should um, process uh, hundreds and uh, thousands of our uh, ERPSs. Uh, so request per seconds. So, so what um, are the problems um, with uh, those um, um, task training? First of all, um, uh, it's it's very expensive. Uh, that's why uh, any mistakes or errors uh, related um, uh, to um, implementation uh, will lead to re um, uh, relaunching, which uh, means uh, time, additional time, money, and we are not interested in that. So we want it uh, comfortable and um, smoothless uh, for us and um, and customer. When you use only limited resources uh, for bigger tasks, uh, while well, uh, we're talking about two supercomputers, um, and when the resources are uh, limited and um, you um, uh, need a half of a cluster to train, so this uh, goes into a queue, which means additional waiting. And of course, we want it to somehow reduce it or avoid it. So because waiting in a queue means that you have um, to wait um, uh, till um, the task is launched, and of course, we wanted to reduce the time of waiting. So also a big task um, when it uh, processes the data, it doesn't do it uh, instantly. So there's some, uh, this is weeks uh, for it to be trained or even uh, more. Uh, so during uh, the, this work, and when uh, there are some uh, errors in the hardware or degradation of the productivity or speed of training, that's also negative for the deliverable. Uh, for instance, uh, degradation of productivity um, uh, can uh, not be seen right away. And of course, we would like to have an instrument um, in place to um, combat those uh, errors uh, and degradation of productivity. So when we uh, identified what large scale task means. I will tell you about uh, those uh, new opportunities um, uh, that we uh, and capabilities that we added to painlessly um, train uh, this type of um, task. So this slide shows uh, the um, uh, splitting into th three groups. Um, reliability, which is number one bullet point here. Um, two our features are here. It's elastic learning and pre-flight check. The second uh, is performance, um, uh, where the dashboard, the performance metrics uh, dashboard, and you can um, see the um, uh, speed of training. And the third is utilization of uh, the cl cluster, uh, smart scheduling. And I'm going to talk about that too. Let's start with the first one. Uh, it's a pre-flight check. What does it mean? It's um, similar to uh, aviation. Before uh, the plane uh, takes off, um, the pilot is to uh, um, check uh, the function of uh, functioning of all uh, systems uh, using the checklist uh, uh, for the slats um, um, or um, uh, the landing gear, whether it's okay, everything opens and closes uh, in a, uh, in a in a, in a, okay. So that's a pre-flight check, and the user can activate it. So that's an active um, verification of GPU uh, for the hardware to uh, correctly operate. So why this necessity at all? We'd like to say that any infrastructure or hardware uh, have their own limitations. Uh, it can uh, fail um, no, or temporarily or at all, and uh, the majority of um, hardware have special monitoring means. Uh, for instance, you can say that the hard disks, uh, that's a uh, uh, Project Smart, uh, which allows you to test for errors. Um, but um, uh, more often, uh, more informative and uh, higher quality is the launch of uh, a small, real uh, task uh, where we can um, um, verify the parameters, input and output parameters, and if everything is okay, uh, the disk can uh, read and uh, uh, write, and the file is okay, then uh, and operates correctly. And then everything is okay. Well, uh, here the logic underpinning is the same as to how such large-scale uh, tasks are to be trained. Uh, there are several links here. You can see on the slide uh, uh, the ML space uh, link. That's our product. And similar logic uh, underpinned uh, the uh, OpenEye. Uh, they also use uh, big clusters to train. And uh, so we are 
uh, doing almost the same. Elastic learning, the next feature is. So we'll tell you what it means. Um, uh, this uh, was implemented in a uh, PyTorch mechanism, and you can see the whole ecosystem which is supported in the product. Uh, quite a lot of different instruments you can see here. It's uh, Torch Vision and uh, Torch Surf, um, and um, uh, to um, uh, put it into production. Also, you can see the Torch Elastic, and I'm going to talk about it um, in more detail. This scheme means that the number of coworkers, uh, the number of uh, those resources uh, who are computing can be fluctuating. It can uh, be in the, uh, re reduced or increased in the process of training, which gives you the following. Uh, during uh, the training of tasks, you can dynamically increase or reduce uh, the resources. And if uh, some of the resources uh, uh, of workers uh, do not uh, respond, we can um, withdraw it from the group and rep replace it. And this, um, for the users, it al allows to provide uh, more reliable operation uh, and some protection from errors, uh, error proof, and it allows um, you to start um, not uh, uh, right away all resources. For instance, when the user um, can use only half of the resources, he can start training with this half of resources. And when um, uh, additional resources are free, then they also can be uh, connected to do the same. So I would like to show you a small demo, and you will see how the launching of tasks uh, uh, is done. And uh, that's an engineering um, part, not only what the user uh, can see, but what really is done. The three uh, workers here, so the f uh, first one is initialized, the, the three others um, are waiting for being launched, and uh, you can see now how it all looks. Uh, so the main uh, message board shows you, and you can see uh, that uh, there's waiting uh, uh, for additional resources uh, to be connected, and you, uh, there's special delay uh, done here for us to be able to see what really, the, how uh, this uh, resource waiting um, uh, looks. Um, then uh, the, uh, it automatically um, uh, picks up the additional resource, and now we can see additional resources added. And in logs, we also will see the total number of um, uh, those worker pods uh, that uh, the tasks. Uh, were uh, launched in, and you can see how uh, the uh, training uh, goes uh, uh, to Evox and uh, the first, and uh, we, we can see four uh, of them now, and we can uh, wait for additional resources to uh, be switched on. And um, so uh, here is another uh, moment. Oh, additional resources uh, are switched, uh, total numbers growing, and we can see that we are now working at six at six pods. Um, it's six workers. Uh, to demonstrate um, um, it, um, uh, it will take 30 seconds, and we will wait uh, for uh, completion of the task. And you will see it in the logs. And we can see that it's a completion of the task, and we can uh, check the status as to what happens at the end uh, of this completion. And we can see that, uh, yes, all pods uh, are correctly completed. Now I will tell you about uh, this new opportunity. It's um, the uh, scheduler, and you can see the uh, architecture of our cluster. The date um, uh, are in NFS uh, storage, and uh, the distributed uh, task is done by IP and after AP, and F after um, uh, the parameters of the tasks goes to API, then uh, it also goes to the scheduler, which is uh, here uh, to the right, uh, right bottom corner. Uh, workload manager and job uh, scheduler, and um, uh, you, we are going to discuss as to what new opportunities we can add to this product. Um, uh, also, I would like to say that uh, there are two features here. It's um, um, uh, one, for instance, priority prioritizing of larger tasks. Well, for instance, if you need a bigger task, uh, so um, you do it, and then um, it goes uh, the smaller tasks. Uh, then the second is uh, spot instances. Uh, those um, uh, discontinued um, um, tasks or um, 
uh, they um, re reduces the fragmentation of the clusters and can be uh, ex um, replaced by other tasks. Uh, when um, a big uh, size task uh, comes to the cluster and if the resources uh, have spot uh, spots, they can be um, uh, uh, replaced. Uh, so this will um, reduce uh, the, um, the time uh, of waiting. Let's um, sort of uh, um, recap as to what new opportunities we now have. Uh, Pre-flight check, it's active um, uh, verification of reliability of functioning of hardware uh, and GPU um, elastic learning, um, which is a mechanism which allows you to dynamically change the number uh, the amount of res uh, number of resources, and also smart scheduler, which um, uh, implements uh, prioritization of bigger tasks uh, and spot instances. So I've showed you our new opportunities, uh, which we added um, to the platform this year. So using this QR code, you will be able to see how it's done, to how you can practically um, train the bigger tasks. Um, so, Alexei, thank you very much. Uh, okay, let's move on. Um, so, Grisha Sterling, technical leader, synthesis uh, uh, devices, uh, speech devices. So, he's going to talk about a very interesting experiment in the field of synthesis of voice. So, Grisha, the floor is yours. We are ready for you. So, hi everybody, I'm Grisha Sterling. I'm going to talk about how I did my own synthesis. First of all, I would like to start saying that uh, what, it, what it all means and what kind of a task it is for um, a user. Um, it's um, uh, something transferring uh, speech into text and uh, uh, actually there are two stages. Uh, we transfer text into the image. It's a MEL spectrogram and you can see it uh, here to the left and uh, then a separate model that um, it goes uh, to the um, sound that we human beings can hear. So here is an example of how full synthesis uh, uh, sounds. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Grisha talking about cyber synthesis. Uh, well, something like that. Let's move on. I would like to so, uh, some um, analogy as to uh, how these two uh, tasks of machine learning are um, implemented. So, acoustic uh, model, which, and there are very many ways uh, of uh, auto regressional and, um, and non auto regressional, and some more popular, more fashionable diffusion. Uh, and uh, we use Tekatron, one of uh, the first technologies which allowed us to synthesize a very cool quality. I'm going to talk about it in more detail. And second stage, uh, when we had the pictogram uh, into sound, uh, to, uh, uh, and we have different classifications there too, pl pluses and minuses. Also, pros and cons, not going to talk about that. So as I said, uh, we in production use um, uh, the Tekatron. It's um, not uh, uh, cute. Track of that. So we use two ideas here. Number one idea is to squeeze the maximum amount of data we can. Or we can. Uh, um, we cannot um, describe as to how human being talks uh, into the uh, model. And at inference, we will predict, um, uh, well, um, using the language models um, uh, as to the sense of it. So uh, the um, scheme you can see on the um, uh, picture, and we can do it manually, not predicting them, but controlling them and managing them um, manually. Sometimes uh, it is uh, quite a useful feature, and I will tell you about it a little bit. The second idea is based on using a uh, big data set. Actually, we uh, recorded uh, um, a big number of speakers, many uh, hours, uh, and uh, that uh, those are the people I know. I'm tired of listening to them, but we noticed that those patterns of those parameters of speech uh, are uh, almost similar for everybody, because everybody uses uh, the same intonations um, and tones and pitch of the voices, and we wanted to use it. 
Now, uh, let me describe what we uh, got from this. Uh, I mean, uh, big data is a must for any um, AI journey uh, conference, and this is how it worked for us. Let's look at the future where we manage um, Synthesis Intonations uh, manually. We called it Paint. Remember old Windows? Um, there was this uh, Paint feature. Uh, it was a pretty rough feature, yet uh, where if uh, you are uh, vectorous enough, you can get decent outcomes. Now, let's um, hear an example of how uh, we can manage the synthesis. I can speak quickly. I can speak slowly. I can speak low. I can speak high. See, something like this. In order to get a better uh, picture, I showed uh, you how we could manage intonations for the entire sentence. But in fact, we can manage intonation for each single word. Let me give you another example. Do you like doggies? Do you like doggies? Again, we just uh, focus on uh, the word that adds the questioning uh, intonation to our uh, sentence. Without changing the syntax, uh, we can use the synthesis the way we want to. Now, as to big data, uh, as I told you, uh, almost all people uh, speak similarly. And uh, when Mono um, learns from many speakers, I mean, uh, the more data we have, the better quality we obtain. And this worked for us. And the model now responds better to the paint feature. Now, the third example I want to give you is about the so-called emphasis. Buses are not a problem, but a solution. Buses are not a problem, but a solution. See, emphasis uh, in uh, academic uh, terms is, in fact, a stress that you put on a certain word or words. You can uh, produce a neutral uh, text, or you can emphasize specific words within your text or sentence. In this case, those words were problems and solutions. I mean, I did not record any uh, data with this uh, emphasis. We use the data uh, that we obtained from speakers when recording those data sets. And this is what uh, now is applied to my voice, too. And now the most important thing, that is why I'm here, is as follows. Uh, we managed to reduce the necessary uh, quantity of data some hundred times over. Uh, now, Five hours uh, is not enough to make such models speak. Ten hours is a consensus minimum in terms of uh, data that is required and that has to be recorded by speakers in order to generate voice. For our technology, I mean, we can do the same, uh, but uh, very quickly, within uh, several hours. Now, I spend um, several hours at the recording studio. Uh, I mean, we had to obtain some 30 minutes of uh, speech recording somehow, and this is what I had to endure. So once again, I got to a recording studio. I used this mic. Uh, altogether, I spent three hours at the recording studio, with breaks, of course. And uh, I read uh, some texts, uh, some uh, normal texts, some weird texts. And then after all the cleaning, in the end, we got about 25 minutes of data. They later were used for uh, training. I mentioned five minutes, but uh, in my case, it was 25 minutes. Now, what are the outcomes? And uh, another important question is how those outcomes uh, can be uh, evaluated. Now, we normally um, use three metrics uh, for 
uh, voice, uh, but we use two. We use side-by-side -side text. We uh, ask uh, humans what they uh, like better, one model or the other, and then we combine voices of different people, and uh, uh, we get SBS uh, matrix in the end. So uh, it means that, say, in two-thirds of cases, uh, people prefer one model, and uh, one-third of cases, they prefer the other one. Now, we use this matrix to uh, compare models using uh, data sets of different volume, and uh, we realized that the model that uh, was trained uh, on the basis of the complete data sets is much better compared to the model that was trained using uh, 15 minutes of data. Well, obviously, the more data we have, the better quality we obtain. This is obvious. Besides, in 33% of cases, uh, the synthesis trained uh, uh, based on 15 minutes uh, seems to be better compared to a synthesis trained on a complete data set. This is kind of counterintuitive, uh, but that's how this uh, metric looks like. And uh, based on our technology, some four hours of speech appear to be enough to train a model and to reach the same quality as if we were to use a full data set. Now, the other uh, metric is pronunciation sentence error rate. This is uh, a number that gives us the number of correctly read sentences from a big data set. I mean, you can uh, misread a sentence. Uh, you can uh, uh, insert uh, unnecessary pauses, or you can uh, commit some other errors when uh, reading out sentences. And obviously, uh, after about half an hour, this metric doesn't seem to increase any longer. I mean, half an hour would be enough to get this metric, uh, which would be comparable to the model uh, trained based on the complete data set. OK, I uh, gave you a picture of my uh, data set. Uh, but um, I synthesized my wife's vo voice, and now we are a cyber family, and what is left for us is just to uh, produce some cyber kids. Uh, we uh, attempted to record some unusual voices. Let me give you just one example, something that we uh, obtained. Mr. and Mrs. Dursel lived in house number four in uh, Bridge Street. This is the synthesis we got. Then we uh, got some real models uh, based on six minutes. And that's when we used our bare minimum to train our models. Now, in terms of characters, uh, we can record a special voice, or we can use a well-known voice and uh, record under unusual conditions. And that's what we do to get whisper or to get emotions. We can record uh, a small part of emotional data set, and the model uh, would perform uh, as expected. And finally, uh, corrupt uh, speech. Uh, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Let's say we have a person who has problems uh, pronouncing words, and uh, we uh, produced a synthesis that also uh, gives out corrupt speech. So it's a nice feature because it helps us to demonstrate that we are able to show some specific uh, uh, properties of uh, a specific speech speaker. Now, where we failed, and what are the constraints and restrictions for our technology? Now, I mentioned emphasis. Now, the emphasis is about one half strong, as we might expect. In other words, the speakers uh, who were recorded, uh, you know, they emphasized specific words much stronger, and uh, we uh, expected that speakers like myself would do the same, but um, the synthesis uh, appeared to be pretty dull or uh, less exciting uh, compared to our expectations. The next uh, thing is uh, avoiding 
learning. Uh, I mean, I spend uh, several hours in recording studios. It's a lot for me, not enough for synthesis. I spent many hours, as I said, in the recording studio, and then models took a lot of time to learn. And in the ideal world, uh, one would like to avoid this uh, learning process somehow. There may be some startups out there, uh, say you record your voice and in a couple of minutes a model would uh, read out a text using your own voice. But um, it doesn't seem to work this way yet. The technology is called zero shot, a few shots learning. As far as uh, voice is concerned, it's voice cloning, voice cloning, and um, um, our uh, model doesn't seem to support this yet. We have to train models, but those models will be very, very good. And one last thing, uh, something that I take very close to heart. You know. I somehow managed to produce a very um, imposing tone, very monotonous tone, and this is something we should avoid. I mean, if you read out something in a monotonous manner uh, as a TV anchor, uh, the synthesis uh, would mimic this. And uh, I guess that's it that I meant to tell you. And now uh, some links for you. Some. Uh, QR codes for you. This is a link to our article on QTech architecture. There is a link to our story uh, about how we re record uh, speakers. And finally, uh, a link to uh, Solid Speech Your Voice project. Uh, this is just a description of our product. And uh, to finish off my presentation, I'd like to make an announcement and an invitation to a chat where you uh, could ask your questions, could interact with us, and so on. Thank you very much. Grisha, thanks a lot. And now we're going to hear from two speakers who uh, deal with data science in Sper. Konstantin Propastin, head of uh, the direction, and Andrei Mosenko, lead researcher. They will talk about uh, using graphs for machine learning uh, and uh, graph embeddings. Konstantin, Andre, over to you. Hello, colleagues, at this wonderful conference. We are very happy to be here with you, Andre and Konstantin from Spear. We're going to talk about embeddings. Embeddings uh, in business um, um, start to be employed increasingly often. This is especially true for big business. I mean, it's good when we have some latent understanding of uh, uh, the uh, elements. You can use uh, fewer uh, data sources, and uh, embeddings are anonymized. And this allows to anonymize data and to use the data uh, um, without uh, being concerned about cybersecurity and without. Uh, uh, any concerns uh, with respect to possible other issues. We're going to talk about graph embeddings that could be successfully employed for tasks where you should uh, trace uh, links uh, uh, between, uh, uh, say, companies or uh, some uh, other elements. We're going to talk about the theory behind uh, embeddings and graph models. We will talk about how uh, these could be optimized. And finally, we will continue with a real life case where we did employ those technologies and where we got very good spillover effects. Hello, colleagues. I'm going to talk about uh, graph uh, neural new networks and how we applied them to our tasks in the bank. In fact, many objects and processes in our world could be world could be presented as graphs, say molecular structure of a uh, substance, social network, roadmaps, even such classical objects uh, like uh, images, texts could also be presented as graphs. And uh, in uh, such cases, uh, 
the edges uh, uh, would be defined by the location of the objects and the vertices uh, would be presented as uh, pixels. Now, uh, linked objects can impose some influence on each other. You know, graph is a mathematical object that is a collection of two sets. V is a set of vertices, whereas uh, uh, E is a set of edges or pairs of vertices with a connection between them. In fact, in terms of ML tasks, we um, are to digitize those graphs. We are to present graphs as numbers for ML models use numerical data. The classical approach to digitizing graphs would be to present graphs as uh, incidence matrix or uh, adjacency matrix, matrix. Now, the other approach would be to calculate graph matrix. Uh, those metrics could be done on graphs or subgraphs or vertex centrality metrics. It's about clusterization, um, the vertex centrality metrics, and so on. And the last approach has to do with uh, own aggregation algorithms, so something that the scientists believe to be relevant for their tasks. Now, the classical approaches have two major limitations. First, they look only at the graph structure, but they say nothing about the fact that objects in the graph may have their own properties or features. Besides, uh, graph metrics uh, are calculated outside of the task at hand, and we don't understand uh, how this might help us uh, address our task. Now, graph neural networks, or GNNs, um, is a generalization of classical uh, class of artificial neural networks for processing data. There are two possible approaches to GNNs. The first is called random walk. And this is where we focus on, sp on a specific node, and uh, we randomly travel along the edges, and uh, we uh, put down identifiers of those nodes as uh, we move on. So the graph is transformed into a link of uh, sequences. Uh, it's a sequence of node identifiers. Besides, we can add uh, some algorithms that are more comfortable with, say, word to vec and uh, we're going to get some embeddings of uh, graph nodes in the end. Now, this approach is called uh, now to vec. Now, the other more exciting approach is message passing. In this case, uh, we observe iterative uh, uh, repetition of nodes. Uh, with respect to neighboring nodes. So this algorithm uh, is described by the formula uh, in the slide. And the presentation of nodes at the next iteration depends on its presentation of the previous iteration and pr presentations of uh, the node's neighbors. Message passing uh, has a major advantage, for it takes into consideration uh, graph objects' uh, characteristics. There are two key algorithms that relate to this approach. First is graph convolution network, and the other is uh, graph attention network. Uh, this is how the two algorithms uh, operate. Now, to calculate uh, the node presentation in the graph convolution network, they use uh, diagonal uh, degree uh, matrix uh, and uh, some parameter uh, matrix. Now, if we were to come up with a specific formula for a specific node, we would see that its presentation would comprise the presentations of the uh, neighboring nodes with some normalization ratios. Now, the graph attention uh, network uh, improves this approach, and it suggests that different nodes can impact their neighbors uh, differently. Instead of a static normalization uh, ratio, we use a linear uh, algorithm A, uh, which uh, learned together with the model. To normalize this uh, ratio, the SOTMAX uh, algorithm is used. So we get uh, alpha to jeta attention uh, algorithm. And the presentation of the node is done by weighted uh, ratios, the sum of weighted ratios uh, of the neighboring nodes' presentations. 
I uh, should also talk about uh, GraphSage, uh, called inductive convolutional algorithm. Uh, you know, this is a pretty good uh, algorithm when graph is not static but uh, can change with time. This is um, uh, the case that we observe most often in practice. The formula changes somewhat compared to the classical algorithm, and instead of uh, adjacency matrix, we use aggregation function. We use mean function, but uh, we can use other f aggregation functions as well, like mean, max, or yell, or something else. Besides, such algorithms normally are employed uh, in inductive pipelines uh, using big graphs for learning uh, and uh, sampling algorithms. Uh, those algorithms can split graphs into smaller subgraphs and uh, could help use GPU to uh, do learning uh, based on huge graphs. A few words on the tasks that could be addressed uh, with the help of uh, GNNs. This is about uh, graph node representation, so in fact building embeddings for those nodes, classification at the node uh, level, graph classification, link prediction, and community detection. A few words on our project. Something that we decided to implement uh, at our bank using GNNs. Uh, the objective is to build graph embeddings of organizations. You know, embeddings uh, are representations of objects in the form of non-interpreted numeric vectors. They become graphs after uh, we use uh, GNNs on them. The key hypo hypothesis is that uh, such representations uh, allow digitizing information about the structure of relationships between our organizations. Um, and uh, this will make an additional contribution to the quality of ML models. So the key targets for the project is to improve the quality of existing uh, bank models using graph embeddings and new models as an additional feature, and um, some research on the possibility of using embeddings for clustering tasks, allocation of logistics chains, and so on. The key uh, advantages uh, are non-interpretability, as strange as it may seem. Non-interpretability allows to use embeddings as a feature um, within um, different uh, bank uh, hubs uh, without uh, affecting security. Besides, uh, they're very convenient in terms of representation of objects for complex sources. Manual feature generation on graphs is a non-trivial task and uh, can be fairly uh, difficult, whereas uh, GNNs uh, allow to automate uh, this task. And besides, uh, it's a universal solution. Now, embeddings could be generated not only uh, on the basis of graphs, but on the basis of other data structures. And this is quite useful uh, for future use uh, with modules. Now, how we managed to create our graph? In fact, uh, our team develops and supports uh, different uh, organizations' windows that are uh, used uh, at our bank. One of the key products is uh, the win uh, win uh, window representing links between organizations. It has uh, information more than 3 million of organizations and uh, their links, uh, economic, legal, and other links. In fact, uh, we assembled our graph based on this window. The next task was to collect features for organizations, for legal entities. To do this, we used other uh, bank uh, windows and panels, and uh, generation used for feature generation is shown here uh, in the slide. We uh, expect that this information will be collected on a monthly basis, and then an algorithm for embeddings generation would be run, and this would help update our embeddings. Now, uh, this helped us uh, produce a graph uh, where nodes are organizations and edges are different links among them. And we plan to compare each organization to a specific vector that would contain information on this specific organization and its links with other organizations. Now, here you see the architecture of the model that we built. First off, we looked 
uh, at the autoencoder architecture without business targets. The autoencoder model, just like for other neural networks, comprises two uh, key components, uh, encoder and decoder. Now, uh, encoder is uh, represent, represented here by a GNN. As you can see, we use inductive uh, convolution uh, algorithm. And uh, as decoder, we use the inner product decoder, which, uh, based on uh, such embeddings, uh, restores information on the links uh, within the graph. One feature of this architecture is that it uh, has a discriminator. You know, it's a neural network that learns in, uh, in parallel with the main uh, network and uh, tries to differentiate uh, the uh, decoder-generated uh, um, outputs uh, and uh, uh, normal distribution outputs. Now, now, this architecture allows us to identify and uh, define links uh, between organizations, which helps us later to uh, clusterize those organizations. Besides, uh, it helps uh, regularize. Uh, in other words, it puts uh, some uh, restrictions on the embedding vectors, which allows to obtain more robust representations of uh, vertices. And um, we use inner product decoder to further uh, use embedding to solve link prediction and uh, clustering uh, problems. Now, we applied this architecture to train our coder, and we calculated embeddings, which produced pretty good uh, outcomes uh, for one of our models. A few words on the model. Let's uh, continue with the practical case. Now, the model is to restore holdings structures. You know, each company, each legal entity, uh, which is our client, and there are many of those, more than 3 billion, I'm sorry, 3 million, <laughs> You know, they can be owned by a holding or could be a standalone company that is uh, not owned by a holding. Now, the links between companies, uh, it's a specific uh, legal link, but it's not uh, easy to guess based on, say, ownership documents. Now, a model is needed to restore those links, to restore holding structure and to understand uh, where we have uh, nuclei for such holdings, uh, which uh, company is owned by which holding. So this uh, would allow uh, to deal with the holding as uh, a unified uh, entity. Uh, this could help us identify uh, profit points in those uh, holdings. And uh, just like with any other model, we have to come up with initial markup. Well, there are client managers uh, who have marked up a lot of companies. They created more than 500 holdings, and uh, they uh, assigned more than 1 million companies owned by various holdings. And then we started to train our model. Now, here is um, how architecture looks like. A company, if uh, it's our bank's client, could uh, be either standalone or uh, could be a part of a specific uh, holding. Now, each uh, company, in fact, all those companies are, are collected in a sample. Uh, well, obviously, there are mergers, acquisitions, uh, liquidations, and all those links uh, tend to evolve and change. And we have to update the structure all the time of such holdings. Besides, uh, new companies uh, merge, and they have to be referred to specific holdings or to understand that they are, they are indeed standalone. Now, the companies, the existing companies, uh, well, though for those, we uh, update uh, our model. For others, so we get predictions from the model. Now, just like uh, for min any other major business project, we have a set of rules that help uh, uh, sift out uh, some cases in order not to use up to many resources. I mean, this uh, helps us understand whether a company is owned by a holding or is a standalone one, and those who are not marked up by those rules are uh, going through uh, an ensemble and getting new data, and the uh, model uh, continues to be 
people that are trained, and I, I want to advertise the outcome, so the work of our lab, uh, something that helps uh, to come up with a model and sample. It's an open library. Now, after going through ML model or inference, a company uh, is identified as either a standalone company or if the model uh, refers the company to a holding, then we uh, do the next stage. We select several candidates. Automatically, some of them are referred to the holdings pool. Others are checked manually by client managers. And after the manual check, we understand whether uh, it's a part of a holding or it's a standalone company. The outcomes of the manual check uh, feed into uh, the learning set, and uh, this helps us to predict better. Now, the out outcomes of the uh, checks help us to gauge the quality of the model. Now, ensemble models uh, use state-of-the-art algorithms. Uh, those are fairly serious models, and uh, this allows us to obtain uh, pretty high quality. At a certain point, we decided to add embedding embeddings and graphs uh, to this and to see what uh, we would get in the end. Well, you know, this uh, helped us to dramatically improve the quality of models per se. We reduced uh, error rate dramatically. We improved uh, precision and quality. Uh, at least by 50 percent. Now, after applying top of the line, the deepest algorithms, still embeddings and graphs uh, show improvements. So this uh, proves that uh, these uh, are to be used in other models, and this could bring in additional benefits. Now, what could be improved? What are further developments we're eyeing? First, uh, it's about improving uh, graph embeddings themselves. We have to enhance them. We can employ either dynamic approaches or we can use multi-target models. Uh, for this, uh, would make our embeddings uh, more robust, um, fitting uh, more tasks. And in terms of business processes, well, you know, we uh, plan to employ graph embeddings for many of those processes. And those processes relate to the identification of links between either uh, physical persons, legal entities, uh, identifying the roles um, uh, within holdings, so all to identify risks and, say, fraud prediction. So this model seems to hold a lot of promise. Thank you very much, colleagues, and uh, carry on. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Konstantin. Thank you, Andre. The next speaker will be Vitaly Yulis, chief engineer uh, for Spare Devices. He will talk about adaptive filtration uh, of uh, interference and uh, Query quality assessment for the virtual assistant. Vitaly, over to you. Hello, I'm Vitaly Yulis, chief engineer for the development of uh, speech technologies, we deal with uh, sound processing, especially with uh, processing signals before speech recognition. So that for our smart loudspeaker to hear your request, it's not as simple as it might seem. In my presentation, I'd like to talk about such technology as uh, purifying or cleaning this sound before the spotter, before the hot word detector. But first of all, what is this spotter that I'm talking about, how it works? What do we mean by a spotter? It's a detector of hot words. It lives in your device. It, it's, it works in the background. It doesn't require to be connected to the network until the moment of recognition and to limit the flow of data. That's why you need it, because it's too expensive to process it all at the server and to avoid false uh, triggerings. It recognizes only the hot word, the keyword, whether it's salute, spare, Alisa's, uh, Alexa, Google, and things like that. 
then it gets uh, the sound after the voice quality enhancement processing. This is an algorithm that takes several uh, sounds from the microphones. If there are several microphones, it has a uh, very low probability of false triggering, so because you, we don't want it to ask you in the middle of the night what you want. It launches the uh, speech recognition at the server. It does work, and then the server continues. And that's what we need to understand what we mean by that. Yet another thing that we need to discuss before we move on to the presentation, it's acoustic echo cancellation, AEC. This is the algorithm that removes the sound of the speaker, of the loudspeaker, from the microphones. Let's say we have a loudspeaker and you have the speaker inside and the four mics. If we get the sound from the microphones and send it to detector and voice recognition, it will not work because this loudspeaker's own voice is much louder than a human speech. Accordingly, the sound in the signal will be quite low, I mean the noise to signal ratio. and. We have this AEC that deals with this issue. Let's see how it works. It use, uses an adaptive filter. This is a, a rather outdated approach from the 1970s. It trains your adaptive system for it to model the response in the room where it's located, the echo journey from the speaker to the microphone. And then it distracts it. The coefficients of this filter are the current assessment of the room and it's sensitive to linear uh, distortions and it doesn't really work well in the double talk mode. It's another important point. If I speak and my and another person speaks, it breaks the system. There are individual methods for that and you may see how it works at a mobile phone when it's on the loudspeaker. It, it's kind of loud, but the person you're talking to does not hear themselves when it gets back to them. It gets cleared at, on the side of the other device. As for the adaptive filters, that's another important point. AC is such an adaptive filter. This is how it works. The input signal is the sound from the speakers, some kind of reference. We have some kind of music that we play on our device. The output signal is something modeled from the speaker, how we should get it at the microphone level. And we distract assessment from what actually came to the microphone, so if we did all right, everything is fine. The noise, uh, uh, the result will be what we were looking for in terms of the cleaned sound. The smaller the error, the better we were able to predict. That's how it's implemented. There are lots of different methods. LMS, Calmond, and different uh, filters, RLS and NLMS, and different filters for different tasks. That's the point here. We look, we assess the transmission channel adaptively as a linear system because it's it's a filter, and the error of the filter is the cleaned signal from the microphone and the reference signal of the disturbance of the noise. This is what we must have because if we don't have it, we have nothing to model. There's also speed of adaptation, which depends on the conditions. Another important point, and yes, and it works in different level, uh, in various uh, frequencies. As for convergence, we need to mention that as well. On the left-hand side, we have slow convergence. NLMS algorithms and fast convergence RLS algorithms. So what we mean by convergence here, how fast it adapts to the change of conditions in reality. The process is not stationary, it keeps moving. People move around, they can talk from one location in the room then from another. The uh, noise sources might change. How do we deal with some of these uh, problems? We can use, uh, we use uh, adaptive Subband filters. We divide the signal into a number of subbands frequency wise. Uh, we had 16,000, for example, uh, reports, so then I get, we, we get 100 reports, uh, 16,000 hertz, or, or we got 100 hertz, and we can process each channel independently, and that's another interesting point. We uh, can use quadratic complexities like Kalman RLS because at high speeds uh, it's really hard to do. In real time you cannot make those calculations and they should overlap these filters. Every band 
impacts the algorithm and then after processing we synthesize it all back we dismantle it then we put it back together how well we design the filters how well we carefully calculate it all it determines our result but these filters usually have better convergence because they, at every band they have better or lower dispersion of the specter and that's why we get better conversion that's the rule another important point analysis synthesis then the time latency and in the simplest form it will give us a latency of a few dozens of milliseconds in our case it was a hundred milliseconds but that can be resolved now these are different types of noises when we uh, spoke about the AEC we had our reference sound and the sound from the microphone we had two signals basically we were combining them in such a way to remove one from another if we don't have the reference part we we cannot do that in such a simple way. What, what if we just get a signal? How are we going to clean it? But we can use spectral distraction, uh, um, subtraction, and uh, for example, we have speech on the left hand side, uh, in the middle, uh, speech and narrow band. A noise uh, you can you can lose one percent of the entire band it's nothing our brain will process it all right everything will be fine if the noise is broadband uh, speech over speech music over speech that's impossible to do that's not the best method subjective perception is there we will remove what uh, distracts us as it happens in masking and such processing before recognition is useless they will only work uh, worse and if we have two microphones for example the method that we are going to consider now we have approached it this is cleaning from two microphones it's similar to the AEC in the way that one microphone is a reference for us to predict the second microphone that's how it works we don't have a reference why don't we have it because our loudspeaker is not connected to a TV it may be a small portable uh, loudspeaker it, it doesn't know what the TV is showing but it's near the TV and the noise is quite loud and the loudspeaker cannot hear the user in there's no way and we and we want to turn off the TV we want to uh, turn up the uh, sound and what's the main idea of the method the method was uh, quoted by the Google team and many teams uh, use it we do as well it's called hot word cleaner it cleans the signal removes the noise altogether and it removes the hot word and before the hot word there's always this range with clean pure noise where there's no useful speech and we adapt this part with the same adaptive filter we send mic 1 to channel 1 mic 2 to channel 2 we use it with the same sub band adaptive filter because we get better convergence and we can use the filters RLS that's why I was talking about in the beginning and we we return the noise signal and there are thousands of filters they are all buffered and we use them in a delayed way we don't give back the error signal immediately but we use it immediately from the past a second ago depending on the length of the hot word we are, we are not quick enough to adjust to the useful speech of the user some hot words going up and down left right and then because the convergence is quite fast and that's the main principle here is using buffers so buffering we use 1024 bands you can get more but that's optimum for 16 kilohertz and the, uh, the latency of coefficient is one second because that's our hot word and let me give you some examples of how it works that how it look looked like before processing you can hear the hot word on the left hand side at the uh, very end of so the spotter would do anything about it and now 
let's see how it sounds after we process it with our method. We hear the speech is much brighter, you can easily hear it, about 21 decibel uh, noise suppression and in the very beginning you see how you still have this noise, the, there's conversions a little bit in the beginning, then you get the conversions and almost no uh, music in the middle. This is the time wise, if we look at a small portion of it where we had that hot word you cannot see it on, at the mic uh, bands, but now you can compare noise and um, the signal. How can we use hot word cleaner? We have a scheme with detectors for each microphone, but it doesn't work in our case because the microphones are not that different. We will not get anything, just waste the resource. We can clean also at first and then use the detector, but there's a problem here because in real life the keyword or hot word doesn't always follow noise. The person could say something and then say the hot word and then the filter adjusts and subtracts everything. Now, there are problems with that and that's why we came up with this hybrid scheme when we have two spotters, two detectors, we send micro signal to one of them and hot word cleaner to another one. And in ideal condition it will work according to the classical scheme from the microphone in the noisy condition we will be able to combine one or the other. These are the graphs of how we improve the precision of recognition. Orange is the hybrid mode, blue is only the hot word cleaner. And in the noisy conditions from TV we gain about 75%. And if we just use the hot word cleaner, that's uh, significantly less. And then we also have this probability of false triggering per hour, and the average gain is pretty good. Under normal conditions, uh, HWC is worse. Sometimes it spoils the signal, because, and that's why it doesn't work as well. And the hybrid mode is around zero. It's just a little bit worse than the basic one, but things we can work in uh, complicated conditions. This drawback is uh, cancelled. In conclusion, let me just say that this is not uh, the end of it. We can upgrade this algorithm. There are many things that we can discuss. Speaking briefly, we can freeze the coefficients and filter not just the hot word but the main request and if we have stationary situation, the noise will have to be removed further, not just at that particular second. We can use more microphones and and we can we still are working on that part but there are uh, some uh, prospects there and if you have several mics you can get good benefits there. Also sub-band adaptive filters can be used without latency and we have two lines in this uh, and then we synchronize those two lines in the hybrid scheme. You don't have to adjust it time-wise. Filter generation with uh, less overlapping and you need to add the results of processing hot word cleaner into the data set because most probably there will be some distortion the spotter may not work as well as it uh, would if we use another situation. And then you may also add bands for adaptation. You don't have to calculate each one of them. You may add one or the other. If you have your own processor based on the... We got 70% of precision, of accuracy in terms of uh, noise uh, suppression in the area of above 20 uh, dB and that gives you 30%, 3 percent of real-time improvement. Thank you for your attention. Come to work for us. This is a list of literature and there's in, including a book on active filtration. I really recommend it on this 30th of November. We'll have Salute AI Day. Come and talk to us. The details are uh, in the screen. Vitali, it was really great. Thank you. We did half of our presentations that we planned and moving on. Next is Tatiana Yazikova. She is a data scientist of Sber and she's going to talk about Sber Translator. The floor is yours.
Hello, everyone. My name is Tatiana Yazykova. I work as a middle data scientist at uh, SBER, our AI center. Let me tell you about SBER Translator and how we trained it and how we optimized multi-language models for the translation system. In today's globalized world, uh, humans need translation. Fyodor de defines it defines translation as a complete rendering of a thought in one language by the means of another language. In other words, you need semantic and stylistic equality between the original language and the language of the translation. And NLP has always uh, dealt with this translation issue. We all remember Google, Yandex, and uh, Deepal, uh, Evilingua, and other companies that worked on that. Why have we decided to use our own solution? The existing solutions, if they are of high quality and we're interested only in such solutions, normally they are cloud-based, which is not real safe when you work with uh, banks' internal documents. Second of all, most of those solutions are not adjusted for a specific domain. They are not adjusted for a specific uh, domain of uh, words or texts. Uh, all existing solutions have uh, problems with um, not working with not popular low resource languages and uh, our business task has become complicated recently let's look at how it looked at the very beginning of our journey we needed to develop a model of machine translation for the language pair of russian and english so that the model could translate with high quality the financial and legal texts and the model uh, would have to be would have would not have to be connected to some online solutions to uh, ensure safety and security and also it would have to work uh, fast and efficient even with uh, low performance three parts here data training and optimization we are going to consider them in that same sequence, in uh, pink, we show the points that we're going to discuss now. What, how do we begin to develop any AI model? We start with baseline. In our case, we tried different pre-trained models like WMT19, and then, for comparison, we trained MT5 base developed by Google. Of course, I failed to mention such an important stage as collection, pre-processing, and data analysis, but we're going to talk about that a bit later. And before we developed the ba baseline, we did all that. Let me say from the beginning, the data were not of a high class, but uh, it actually rarely happens. Um, uh, this one other thing that we did not consider, which impacted our baseline model, there was significant overtraining for a specific domain, but we still hoped that it'll, it will preserve the training capability for the general domain. The second point was that uh, there was about 5% of text in languages that were not part of our language pair, neither English nor Russian. We hope that 5% of data was not significant to to clean them manually from millions of uh, pairs of sentences, but then eventually we had to deal with that. And then what we noticed was that these models had complications when they had to translate names, ge geographic uh, or geography words on um, names of goods. For example, these are two sentences where IKEA is written in two different ways, and that impacts the generalizing properties of the model when it has to translate other substances like that, whether it have to literally copy it or use meaning. That's why we uh, decided to train the model additionally to train such uh, substances separately. And now let's move on to data. Originally, we had 4.5 million pairs of uh, sentences for legal and economic domain. We cleaned them a little from special symbols, lines without any letters at all, and then we removed from the sampling lines uh, where it had uh, less than a certain amount of tokens. Then after the baseline, we added 5 million, added 5 million pairs from open data where 2 million were taken from different HF uh, 
types, HF dataset and 3 million from open subtitles. We filtered the entire array of data using XML Roberta base with the full identifier of the model you can see in the slide. And then the final data set looked like this. We had 8 million pairs for training and the rest was left for uh, testing and validation. It has to be noted that we specifically put the validation together in the first uh, test in such a way so that it would only have our data from our target domain and the second uh, test was uh, of general type to check whether the model was overtrained. Our model became significantly more complicated after a while. One, while one part of the team developed the translator engine, another part of the team headed by Olga Bestrova developed speech-to-text engine. Speech recognition or transcribation. And when we discussed the details with the client, we expanded the functions now of our development and we added the ISR component to uh, process not just text but speech. We also realized that at the bank there was a problem that many clients came from the CIS countries who, whose uh, native language was not Russian. and. That's why we had to add not just Russian and English, but other CIS languages. But there was another problem in that situation. There are fairly few data sets for those languages, and we had to use this technique of back-to-back -back, uh, translation, where you translate uh, data into that language and back to make your sampling richer. And we concentrated on optimizing inference. And the models were not easy at all, and they uh, required additional computational resources to optimize the models. We, we tried two approaches, pruning, when you sort of cut the weights of your models, and using quantum technique, when you move it from one format to another, from uh, flow uh, six, uh, 64 to flow uh, 32 or even 38. And here, in terms of pruning, we removed individual tokens from the vocabulary, reducing the incoming and outgoing layers. We could do it without losing the quality because our original model was designed for 101 languages, including Asian, Arabic languages, where alphabet is different from the Cyrillic or uh, Latin alphabets. And we were able to reduce complication here without losing quality. After pruning, we optimized the inference uh, quality, and we now were able to convert the uh, model into an OLX uh, format, where there is also uh, using of uh, quantum, but in a different way. We tried to do it using native, such native tools as Torch, and also used Fast to Five uh, to use. ONNX library, and the ONNX conversion was about on 30% faster on, on average than simple pro process using the Torch instruments, and the quality losses were insignificant. And now to the most complicated and interesting part of the presentation, how we fine-tuned fine our NT5 model using regular approach using what they call reinforcement learning, a bit of theory first. We, our task can be described as sequence to sequence, which is a quite typical NLP task. And the main goal here is that we need to move one set or sequence into another. And uh, one such example is when you need to summarize your text or question, question and answer system or gender uh, extraction of uh, named uh, uh, substances. And before the transformers, they used the RNN principles or the models based on the long chain of elements of short-term memory. And the architecture of the model based on transformers is now the foundation of almost all cutting-edge NLP models. There are three types of uh, major models. The Betalite models based on encoder and transfor transformer. This is usually used for classifiers or named substances. The DPT-like models, those that consist of only decoder and transformer they use for genera generating 
the text. Anastasia Tabolina, for example, developed a special approach for control generation of uh, texts so that congratulations could be put together based on uh, the addressee profiles. The transformers themselves were used to for translation as such. And one such example was uh, the task from Google or the one called Embark from Facebook AI. All those components together and separately can be pre-trained using some general tasks and then uh, fine-tuned for specific tasks. This is what we call transfer learning approach and we reduce the costs for and efforts to train the final model. You can take the pre-trained model from there are different hubs for that. For example, the, the Facebook has its own one and another quite popular one there. And it cuts the time that you spend to train your model as well as you reduce the amount of data and computational resources and then the generalizing capacity of this approach is better. You can uh, train and uh, fine-tune the model. It's uh, One approach is called supervised, which is one of the most common ones, semi-supervised, when you have a pool of marked and non-marked data unsupervised usually used for clusterization when you don't have any marks at all and this dark hole, dark course of reinforcement learning. Conceptually this approach is different from the ones listed above in a way that it makes model training uh, closer to what we humans use, the uh, error and uh, trial and error method. Th this, is, this is some kind of interaction with some in kind of environment. You get positive and negative feedback and then we analyze it and adjust to this environment. Uh, imagine a kitten uh, who, who is still blind but it, it begins to uh, explore the world. If we use the same paradigm for our sequence to sequence task, our uh, reinforcement learning uh, model here works as an agent and the environment is represented by our pool of translated uh, texts and the action or interaction with the environment that's one or the other method of generating the translation and the feedback uh, connection will be used as values of our target metrics. All, uh, can we use all approaches of reinforcement learning for sequence to sequence tasks? Unfortunately not. They cannot work with undifferentiated metrics and metrics for sequence to sequence are exactly like that. That's why we can use reinforce or autocritic self-critical uh, approach. We have those three uh, reinforced group approaches. They were good enough for our task. Let's look at each one of them briefly. Now, the essence of the reinforced learning is that we use our model fixed generation method and step by step maximize the target metric. Reinforce with the baseline. I mean, that's the same as for the reinforce option, but we also add comparison of our selected generation method, method with the baseline. And the baseline uh, could be uh, some other model, which happens most of the time, or just a metric. More often than not, they would choose a model that uh, trained in a previous epoch. Now, self-critical sequence training. This algorithm is uh, an individual case of uh, reinforced baseline, but we have just one model and two generation methods. One is kind of baseline, the other targets. Self-critical sequence training. That's what we've been using. Why? You know, to optimize a model for a target metric is something which is very, very convenient. However, I should stress that we failed to use the target generation method because of uh, the difficulty in obtaining the probabil uh, token probability matrix. Yet, it helped us to improve our model, uh, including for our generation uh, method. Compared to other approaches, uh, reinforcement uh, learning approaches, this one has uh, less uh, metric variability and uh, any reinforcement learning approach would have a lot of variation and uh, here we just compare this one to others. Besides, this method fits better for uh, limited computational resources because it performs fairly well, with, even with small batches. And obviously using one model instead of two is uh, simpler. Now, 
The last approach I mentioned, uh, we use this uh, for uh, recently published uh, Errol for LM's library by Alan and I. Unfortunately, uh, in our case, uh, this resulted in uh, worse models compared to what they used to be. Now, uh, to identify the best model for sequence to sequence uh, is not a trivial task. We have to take in, uh, into account a lot of uh, factors, such as semantical and lexic precision. The sentence, man went underground, or a gentleman uh, uh, walked down to metro, are very similar, but in terms of uh, lexic, um, coincidence, uh, I mean, uh, there are some uh, major differences here. Uh, besides, uh, the definitions are pretty strict sometimes. So we uh, finally settled uh, at Meteor, Patrick, uh, which is uh, stronger than uh, the linguistic, and we use the world and net. Now, uh, in terms of comparing different approaches, look at the table. The table gives you a meteor metric for three models trained by the classical supervised method. The models uh, differ only in terms of the number of epochs. Despite the declining uh, losses value, uh, we see that for test uh, samples, uh, the improvements are not significant. Uh, for the uh, common domain, uh, the uh, outcomes drop when we reach 47 epochs, and this proves our hypothesis that we have to train a model for a specific domain. Now, the other table uh, used a supervised model trained at uh, 30 epochs, and uh, we looked at both uh, blue and uh, meteor matrix. The ultimate quality was gauged based on Meteor. And as you can see, the quality improvements after reinforcement learning uh, was greater. Now, the uh, translation uh, improved dramatically in terms of semantics. And uh, this is uh, what other uh, researchers uh, point out. Now, let's uh, draw a line to our experiments. One interesting fact is that it is better to train your model uh, using supervised methods and then to fine tune using uh, supervised uh, approaches for uh, ML is a fairly long process. We have to uh, think of linguistic models. If you use big models, you're going to have some difficulties in terms of generation methods. Uh, these uh, have been designed uh, for us, and you, you use off-the-shelf model. It's uh, easy, but uh, when you have to uh, improve an existing one, this might be challenging. Now, uh, what uh, solutions uh, we can suggest? You can uh, rewrite a score, or you can uh, implement something over and above the initial model, or use some native generate technique. We employed all possible options, and we realized that to write a method over and above the um, Initial model would be the optimal approach. Now, if uh, you decide to follow our approach, you have to monitor the model quality. Otherwise, uh, you might not be able to stop uh, learning before uh, the model starts to uh, relearn. Now, the accumulation of uh, gradients uh, helps improve the learning capacity of the model. This. Uh, can be used when you are in no position to use big batches, and this improves learning capability. Besides, you should look not only at matrix, but also at translation, because uh, matrix not always reflect properly uh, the true translation quality. Well, in conclusion, RL is uh, not a stable approach to learning, although a very promising one. Some uh, methods uh, you might find useful, some others could be pretty volatile. Uh, but uh, do carry on and you will succeed. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to entertain your questions. Uh, feel free to uh, email me and uh, we'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Tatiana. The next speaker will talk about data protection and uh, customers' uh, resources. Uh, Dmitry Asanov and Maxim Krilov of uh, Zbier 
at uh, the innovative uh, research uh, departments at the uh, Interbank Security Division. Over to you. Distinguished colleagues, guests of AI Journey, I'm Dmitry Asanov. Hi, I'm Maxim Krilov. We will tell you uh, about our study called uh, AI uh, monitoring of uh, polygraph screenings. Uh, this is about deception detection or lie detection. This is about identifying uh, lies or hidden information. Uh, this is a multidisciplinary uh, set of uh, studies, and uh, these are done in psych psychology, neurosociology, forensic, criminalistics, uh, computer science, AI, and many others. The uh, lie detection or deception detection is something that society is increasingly interested in. This year alone, we saw three uh, long reads issued by uh, ID.com UK, BBC, and uh, Scientific American Journal. In fact, we're happy to report that we managed to point our finger on uh, the next big thing, and uh, we started to deal with the uh, deception and detection uh, as early as 2021, before any of those long reads uh, were published. Our key objective is to improve our clients' money and uh, clients' data and protect the bank's ecosystem. This is a key thrust of uh, our research done by the Innovation Department and Internal uh, Security Department. We uh, do several thousands of polygraph screenings per annum, uh, but uh, these are done only upon consent of staff uh, and uh, in risk areas and in uh, strict compliance with uh, legislation. We wanted to take a practical look at the uh, hidden information. This helped uh, us obtain uh, objective second opinion, just like in healthcare. Well, there were several reasons to this. Uh, this allowed us to quickly, in an automated manner, to perform screenings. A number of those screenings uh, keeps going up every year. This also uh, helped um, improve uh, the quality of processes employed for deception detection. Besides, uh, in an environment where uh, some major risks may be present due to deception or lie, uh, this whole topic is not just uh, an academic research topic, but this is a very practical uh, area. Now, uh, we use thousands of uh, anonymized uh, screening data, but there was there was no mechanism of using raw data. Now, the other issue when we started to delve into the topic, when we wanted to understand which features to uh, employ, we realized that in practice different techniques are used, different approaches are employed, and there are combinations. And ob obviously this uh, affects uh, polygraph screening outcomes. And this is something that prevents uh, from a uniform approach. So we decided that our methodology should not depend on the screenings uh, technique. In fact, uh, our approach uh, should help identify uh, features that would serve as the basis for decision making. Now, even if we're able to extract data, we would not be able to obtain a data set uh, that would fit for training. 100% uh, correct or 100% incorrect. Um, Conclusion uh, might give us uh, irrelevant uh, data sets. So we had to decompose this task into major stages, uh, which helped us to lo start looking at uh, models. First, we wanted to uh, come up with an extracting tool uh, to extract data and store data for further processing. Then we had to create a data set of more than 2,000 uh, polygraph files and uh, describe those uh, using our model. And uh, we had to design the model per se that would uh, help identify even one wrong conclusion based on our data set. After several failures, we managed to uh, design a raw data extractor uh, using such data as blood pressure, uh, heart rates, uh, 
trimmer, etc. In addition to the extractor, we uh, developed a uh, converter for legacy files for NCCA and ASCII. In fact, it's an international uh, standard to uh, store and keep polygraph screenings. The success with the extractor helped us uh, develop data sets uh, from raw data, and this allowed us to actually uh, start doing data science. Later, we will tell you about some other important discoveries, but the information presented here uh, is about the information used for uh, each risk factor or each topic. This is something that has never been done before by anyone. And this helped us to come up with some very important conclusions we're going to talk about later. It's not enough to create models that would uh, help uh, come up with conclusions based on raw data presented in the uh, screening. All that we can see is uh, precision of uh, the conclusions uh, done by the person responsible for polygraph screening. But in order to identify contradictions, in those uh, conclusions, a pilot was needed, a real-life pilot, where models would uh, uh, highlight uh, screening outcomes uh, that uh, run contrary to uh, polygraph uh, expert conclusions. So to achieve this, uh, we invited two independent experts, and the idea was to find at least one contradiction in conclusions. The pilot outcomes are as follows. 30 conclusions uh, were found problematic. In other words, one or two experts believed that uh, the f a certain risk factor uh, had been identified, whereas in reality, no such factors had been identified. So this is uh, the pinnacle of a two-year-long uh, research project. We also wanted to uh, expose you to sort of some other outcomes. We demonstrated that different uh, type of data, not physiological data, would be meaningful and important for uh, analyzing screening outcomes. Uh, we were the first to use non-physiological data to uh, analyze uh, screening outcomes. You know, uh, such data are very convenient. We dealt with historic data set, but we managed to come back to enrich it with uh, physiological data, and we did not rewrite the data set. This is not about any specific person, and we don't need any specific sensors to uh, obtain the data. Now, we uh, have models uh, that are not based on the technique employed for the polygraph screening, and this in increases their value for as a source of second opinion. Now, the models now are able to identify some facts uh, uh, that uh, indicate uh, some countermeasures uh, to uh, screenings, uh, despite the fact that uh, screening outcomes appear to be correct. And uh, this helps to come up with a golden standard for data set. But the most important thing is the distribution of risk factor outcomes. They suggest that the model, uh, in terms of its uh, risk factor quality, uh, loses out to others because uh, the the definition uh, water is blurred, and there is no point in imp further improving uh, modeling. Uh, instead, uh, tasks have to be decomposed, and uh, now we are piloting uh, our uh, tools. Uh, we're in the process of patenting um, our approaches, and uh, we described uh, the outcomes of our project in uh, a uh, scientific article. We plan to employ recurrent neural networks. Uh, and uh, to expand uh, support to the various device manufacturers. Uh, this is it. Uh, thank you very much. Hopefully, uh, this uh, was quite interesting. Thank you. Petri Maxim, thanks a lot. It was uh, very insightful. Thank you for your very rich presentation. Now let's hear from Anton Tamilov, a uh, senior researcher of CRT companies, uh, doing uh, voice recognition, uh, speech synthesis, and uh, dealing with many other issues. He will talk about uh, voice anti-spoofing used to protect uh, voice biometry against uh, different types of attacks. Now, what this anti-spoofing is all about, this is uh, a means uh, to counter uh, intrusions coming from uh, the identified IP address. Anton, over to you. Hello. 
my today's presentation will deal with uh, big models used for voice anti-spoofing. I'm going to talk about the challenges and uh, uh, prospects. I'm Anton Familov, and I, I've been uh, dealing with voice anti-spoofing for two years in the uh, CRT company. You know, CRT company is a global developer of products and solutions um, based on um, machine learning, uh, computer vision, and uh, voice recognition. We are a technology expert in terms of uh, speech technologies and voice biometrics. Before I uh, dwell on uh, voice anti-spoofing, let's talk about voice biometry. Uh, it is meant to uh, help identify and verify users based on his or her voice. In order to record a voice, a mic is used that uh, generates a digital image of the signal. A lot depends on the communication channel, on the communication quality, and uh, card egg equipment. Uh, decoding signal is fed into the model, which uh, normally would be a deep neural network. Uh, this model uh, can identify specific uh, characteristics of uh, the speaking person irrespective of the recording quality. And then these are compared to um, the patterns present in the system. And uh, we see whether uh, such patterns fit with identified characteristics. This system allows for better uh, comfort of the clients and uh, better security. Now, with the advent of uh, biometric, uh, voice biometric system, we see the advent of uh, systems that could be employed to attack these biometrics. For instance, two key uh, attack types uh, can be observed. That is uh, replay uh, attack and uh, logical attack. That's when you synthesize uh, client's uh, voice. Now, this uh, attack uh, can be done via communication channel or via loudspeakers. In order to combat such attacks, we suggest to use an anti-spoofing system, which helps identify whether uh, the voice recording is uh, authentic or not. Now, in terms of uh, replay attacks, uh, we search for artifacts of mics and playback devices, and we also look at uh, the acoustic scene features that could be employed by the wrongdoer. In terms of logical attacks, the system looks for artifacts of algorithms, for instance, uh, voice uh, synthesis system or uh, voice conversion system. Now, voice anti-spoofing system, when uh, looking at audio file, uh, come up with a score from zero to one. So the closer you are to zero, uh, the more probable that you're dealing with the authentic client. And uh, what matters is to select uh, the optimal threshold. If uh, you put your threshold too close to zero, we will uh, sift out uh, authentic clients. However, if we put the threshold too close to one, we will uh, let in too many attacks. Now, if uh, our threshold is such that the probability of uh, not uh, filtering out uh, clients and uh, not letting into uh, many attacks, uh, this uh, would uh, correspond to the EER, which is optimal. Well, this uh, threshold is not mandatory, but optimal. Now, uh, task setting and metrics. Um, are used to identify why this uh, problem is uh, so relevant and continues to be relevant. Why can't we can't address it once and for all? Thing is that every year we see new and uh, 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 more sophisticated uh, voice uh, recording and voice uh, replay systems, and uh, collecting this data. Um, using different codecs um, does not help us to collect all the combinations. And reply attacks uh, uh, are likely to happen more often than uh, voice conversion attacks. And this uh, tips the balance, uh, which should also be factored in when training your models. Besides, the model learns fairly well the characteristics that are present uh, for a certain base. For instance, this table 
at the bottom suggests that if we uh, train our model using a base, the uh, quality for our model uh, trained with the SAS um, base is uh, about 1%. ERR is 1%. It's pretty good. However, if uh, we test it uh, based uh, on uh, other uh, databases, then the quality would be very low. So it's basically a random choice. It's guessing. So uh, when you switch domains, uh, the attack recognition quality might decline dramatically. And this uh, results in some difficulties in terms of choosing a model that would be able to handle all possible models in uh, real life conditions. You know, there is this uh, uh, ASV spoof challenge, uh, uh, which ha is a biennial challenge, and for the first time it was done in 2015. Our company, uh, our team uh, is a leader uh, and has been uh, a leader throughout um, the whole life of this challenge, and to some extent we help m define trends for the entire community. Back in 2015, the challenge dealt with uh, speech uh, synthesis recognition. Uh, manually constructed features were used uh, to identify synthesized attack in 2015. Now in 2017, uh, when uh, dealing with uh, recording attacks or recording based attacks, uh, deep neural networks were employed by the challenge participants. Um, they used MEL characteristics or spectral uh, features. In 2019, uh, the challenge participants uh, dealt with both, both uh, physical attacks and uh, synthesis-based attacks. And we uh, see the advent of networks that use raw signal and not end-to-end -end systems. In 2021, uh, more attacks, more sophisticated attacks appear, different uh, contexts are employed, and a different type of attack uh, emerged, the one uh, having to do with it, uh, the identification of deep fakes on the web. Now, workshops are held, uh, publications are made um, based on the outcomes of uh, the challenge, and the number of participants uh, uh, grows every year. In 2015, there were about 20 teams participating. However, in 2021, the number of such teams exceeded 70. And uh, the teams represented universities and uh, companies from all over the world. In addition, the um, databases collected during the challenge are used to develop an, uh, voice anti-spoofing technologies. And at present, the best uh, results are uh, demonstrated by uh, big models. What are big models? A typical representative of big models is RawNet2. It's, uh, let's say, in raw signal. Then uh, it goes to the convolution uh, unit of the feature extractor, uh, vector extractor. Then uh, those vectors are masked and uh, are channeled to the extractor. Then we have to identify which uh, vector was masked. Now, this model helps uh, identify a good representation of the vector voice signal without the need for markup. And uh, it helps uh, to employ a lot of data for uh, training. The number of parameters for this model is uh, pretty big, too. And this obviously affects uh, the speed of operation. Now, uh, if we were to compare this model to the one used back in 2021 uh, at the anti-spoof challenge, this one would be uh, very much demanding or more demanding in terms of number of operations uh, needed to process one second of speech. Now, those models uh, could be employed for many tasks, uh, say, recognizing uh, emotions of the speaker or for voice anti-spoofing purposes. Now, we uh, used uh, the models uh, for the deployment of data from a variety of bases, and we can compare the quality. Uh, uh, the VR for, say, small uh, models and big models. And as you can see, big models almost everywhere uh, help improve quality. ER goes down sometimes several times over, which is obviously good. Besides, small models 
are able to operate faster. And uh, small models uh, can process 52 seconds of audio uh, in the course of one second of the algorithm, whereas big uh, model needs uh, one second to process three seconds of uh, speech. Now, uh, there are uh, such techniques as pruning technique. And uh, let's consider the pruning algorithm employed for the matrix multiplication, which normally is used for deep uh, neural networks learning. Unless we introduce additional constraints uh, or restrictions to this pruning structure, uh, then we can ground uh, the absolute weights and we will not get significant acceleration. Instead, uh, we should use stratified matrix multiplication. Now, if we are to uh, network ground either uh, columns or rows, the uh, resulting matrix would be smaller. We reduce the size, and uh, naturally this uh, speeds up the model. Now, the structural pr pruning is also about uh, calculating a norm, either uh, in terms of column or row, to rank them and to see which ones uh, could be eliminated. This is not always optimal, and we uh, suggest that uh, importance factors be used for each column or row, uh, row would like to eliminate. This factor is introduced into the trained model, and it allows to see to what extent uh, inclusion or exclusion of uh, a block might affect the model performance. Now, the introduction uh, of this importance factor into uh, three uh, blocks uh, say self-attention head is shown in red here the feature extractor to convolution module is a green line here now based on this we can assess whether the drop in quality would be significant uh, with a given percentage uh, of uh, pruning. Now, this graph is shown in the left-hand uh, button part uh, of the screen. Uh, the quality degradation for different uh, components would be different. Uh, this is uh, due to uh, parameter uh, Superficious, and uh, we can see which part of uh, this whole uh, block can be eliminated. Now, the right hand uh, graph can help us restore the pruning parameters and understand what kind of uh, acceleration we can obtain when pruning uh, various uh, models. Now, we managed to uh, accelerate the uh, operation of the model three times without drop uh, in quality. Now, in conclusion, uh, there is some similarity between anti-spoofing and anti-virus. Uh, you know, if you employ anti-spoofing, uh, you help your client feel more comfortable and more protected. Voice uh, biometrics is an area where we see uh, the surge of uh, new attacks. And this obviously uh, demands that you always monitor the situation. And uh, at the moment, uh, big models are best uh, in terms of uh, doing anti-spoofing work. Uh, but those models are pretty heavy in terms of uh, the volume of calculations. And we can split them up uh, using the techniques based on importance factors, something we talked about in our report. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Bye. Anton, thank you. Moving on to Fyodor Telezhenko, Executive Director of Sber, and he will tell us about how to select products for individual clients and how the selection of clients might change depending on their needs. Fyodor, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Let me tell you about our bank's recommendation system, how we 
designed our cross sales uh, process. Uh, let's look at the process. The, as uh, we have this incoming client flow, we can subdivide it into three parts. The client comes to a bank's office. Uh, they have they have a need. They want to open up. Uh, they want to make a deposit, pick up their debit card, or take a loan. They take a, a queue ticket, and then if there is no line, no queue, then they immediately go to the employee. They then he is issued the plastic card. The loan is processed. The account is open. Our deposit is made, and then there is still time where for the employee to talk to the client telling them about additional proposals. That's our recommendation system. We need to suggest the client, uh, propose to a client the uh, offers that they might be interested in, the relevant products. And there are 10 steps here. You set the task, you select and prepare requirements, you build your model, you validate it, and so on. It all the way to production, to validation of solutions, scaling, and so on. Today, we are going to talk about how we approach this task, how we prepare the models, selected the best models, and what kind of result we got. It's in the top of the slide. In the bo at the bottom of the slide, it's the technical part, which I will not cover in this presentation. Let's see what kind of business type did we have, why it makes sense to select products for every client instead of offering them all the products that we have available. Spare is not just a bank today, it's more than a bank. And on top of uh, regular banking products, like loans, deposits, or bank cards, we can offer a broad range of ecosystem products from all areas of life, spare box, spare health, and so on. That's how we formulate our task. We have a limited amount of time. We need to give the client a relevant offer. And for, in terms of business tasks, from after every visit of the client, the bank needs to get maximum profit. If we have X number of visits, for those X number of visits, using our smart recommendation system, we need to earn additional amount of money and for the bank. And what, what about our ML task? How does a bank make money? We get, we get revenues and profits when we sell products. And here, when we sell one spare prime, we get a thousand rubles when we sell spare box, four thousand when uh, an account is open. 5,000. These are not real examples, just for the sake of this uh, presentation. And we need to predict the probability that the client will choose and uh, officially process this selected uh, product. Then we multiply it by the revenues from selling this product and then uh, calculate the expected profit. And then we need to select uh, the most relevant products for the client and then meaning that they are also most profitable for the bank. And how can we forecast or predict whether the client will purchase this product or not? And what kind of delay we have? Here's how we describe a visit of the client to the bank. What kind of client came to the office? Which office uh, they selected? What kind of employee they got in touch with? And the additional context of the visit, for example, time of the day when they came. On top of that, we can use uh, the relevance of the, of the data. We can use retro data of two months old data, and we can take real-time data that we have available at the time of the visit. In this slide, the maturity of our recommendation system is divided into three stages. First of all, uh, the retro data, the standard approach, which is used in predictive analysis in many banks. And the next stage is when we add data on a specific employee. Uh, because we have uh, several dozen million of uh, clients who come to our offices and we have several dozen thousand employees and thousands of products and this is a, a matrix with billions of uh, cells which is really hard to store and that's why we need online calculation and the third step is true real-time modeling 
or simulation when we use data at the moment the client comes to the bank. We consider how long they stayed in line before they were contacted by a specific employee, how many tickets has this employee covered, whether they are tied or not. And this is our real-time system that we are trying to implement. And here's another question in general. What, where, or how can we get better accuracy, whether we use more sets of data or bigger sets of data or use more relevant or up-to-date data? For that, we need to build a matrix of dependency of uh, accuracy on the relevancy and uh, precision of data, I mean, uh, time of data. And we can use one of the products as an example. We use model with retro data, predict the probability of processing a specific product, but here the accuracy is 39%. Uh, this is what, what we start with. In real time, we get a growth of plus three percentage points, which is insignificant. If we take data for specific employees with a certain delay, with retro data, we see the growth of nine percentage points and so on. When we go through this matrix, we see that the use of all data with maximum accuracy and relevancy that we have up to date gives us an overall growth of plus 38 percent. That's the goal that we have. And but it is labor intensive, it requires fine tuning, integration with different systems of the banks, of the bank. That's why we um, use a step by step approach using the option in the middle. We use all available data with, with the delay of one month. This approach gives us growth of 10 percentage points. And this matrix will have to be built for all products. We have several dozens of them, and we need to keep them up to date to change them if their accuracy goes down. But it's obvious that the process itself is quite costly and labor intensive. We need to standardize how those models are built and then changed if accuracy goes down. We already implemented this approach at our bank. We developed a, an internal product called Dream ML. This is a solution which allows us to train several models, many models in parallel using the cloud structure. And the, this is how the model building process looks like. We put the data set together, we mark it for all necessary products, and then we keep leave it for training for the night. And then in the morning, we come and we look at the report, what kind of models we got, and if we need to do additional feature engineering, and then then we do retraining again. Let's look at the features of a specific model. Our baseline for the model with retro data with uh, 12 uh, features, but then we added seven features from the channel, from the goal of the visit and for individual employee data. The main contribution to the final model was made by employee features, how well they can sell this product. For example, uh, whether they can communicate to the client uh, the advantages of Spare Prime, uh, whether it will have any benefits. And this is a powerful instrument. We can, we can show to our employees which uh, products they can sell well, and then it will also go to the top of the list to be offered to a specific client. To sum up, what do we have? We see the uh, income from selling each product. We get the probability of selling it to individual clients. We can multiply those two uh, values, and we see the expected uh, profit from showing this product to the client that we rank the final list, and then we select top three proposals. All together, these three proposals or offers will be presented to the client. These uh, products are most relevant for the client, and they will give greatest uh, revenue to the bank. We just uh, launch an A-B test, and where we will have the baseline model uh, with uh, retro data from the client, and in the second group, we'll have uh, the model trained uh, with additional sources of data, and we will see that based on the results of the pilot, we have increased not just in the quality of the model and also in the 
profit for the bank. Thank you very much. And that's it from me. Thank you, Fyodor, for this really interesting presentation. And now we move on to the analysis of video and audio content for to optimize our meetings. And here I introduce to you Evgeny Abzalov. Uh, from Zber, he is head of the data collection division. Head of data research, Zber. Hello, my name is uh, Shenia, and I'm going to tell you a story of one project team that decided to develop a product. Uh, a bit of theory first. If you are a project manager, you have a clear logic of how you operate. You get your task, and then you balance uh, between them, and then you uh, lead those or take those tasks to a certain level, taking into consideration time limitations, your man hours, and a huge amount of work that you have to do. The project manager task has to do things right. For the product manager routine management of the process of developing the project, is only part of working on the project. You also have to form your strategic vision for the project. For that, you need to understand the, the market in which you're going to use your product, and very good understanding of users with all their pains and the user journey and then you need to remember about the money. Product manager as opposed to project manager has not just do things right but do the right things. And did you feel the difference if you are good with developing projects, someone comes to you and says these sacred words it's time to make a product then sell it to everyone in the entire world you are inspired you you say let's do it how do you turn a project team into a product team first option you are working on a project everything is cool you have a well united team a great leader and then you say we'll be making products from what we did in the past the second uh, option overlaps with the first one but in an ideal case you get a new idea you see what you think is a new idea and then you you are trying to answer the question, why do we need to do that? Why a metal uh, work has to develop AI? And then, we, then you say, uh, let's make a product. And the third option is legacy. That's my option. At our AI center, we organize webinars for colleagues from different other divisions of the bank to give them different AI cases, what kind of technologies exist, and how business can use it for their benefit. And to us, it's really stressful. We are not professional speakers, but when we repeat and train and getting support, Support from our uh, service academy division, we realize that we keep repeating the same mistakes. We have video recordings of our presentations and the technologies that can analyze those video recordings without using hundreds of thousands of people. That's why we decided to come up with a simulator uh, that would help you and as it's helping us to improve your presentation and remove uh, simplest mistakes. Uh, this one, uh, this is the first version where I did not participate. It had some simple functions, uh, including uh, speaker uh, um, voice recognition, and then it would uh, go to a dashboard, improving your pitch and uh, the dynamics of one's presentation. The system understands when the speaker switches the slide, uh, separates recommendations for each individual slide and for the entire presentation. This is how I inherited this uh, product, and I was a newly appointed product manager for this. I made a selfish mistake, which is quite common. I decided the pre previous hypothesis was weak. I have to. Uh, I thought I had to redo everything and start from scratch. I had my own ideas. I couldn't sell uh, those ideas. We uh, use agile principles and uh, decided brainstorm the products using all most fashionable. Uh, practices, value proposition, pragmatic persona templates, and so on, it, 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 we were able to improve our working routine, and eventually we developed a number of product ideas. Some of them overlapped with mine, and others were really new and interesting. But how were we to select the best ones? We had three dozen different hypotheses. Most of them seemed cool, but we could not say about any one of them, okay, we, that's what we need to do now 
and here. And we could subdivide it into tasks and ranking it using old school options, cost value, cost risk, what we start with, what we uh, postpone or what we never touch. There were two problems though. We did not have a real client. Uh, that's why we didn't understand how to uh, understand the value of the client and didn't, didn't want to repeat the old mistakes. And the second problem, all those tasks were from different areas of uh, the product and in different contexts it complicated the assessment. And that's why we wanted to offer a laconic structure of our hypothesis using voting within our team, put the cool presentation together and go show it to our potential clients that what that was an ideal plan, that it failed. The internal client said, okay, it was cool, even they started using it, but the number of uses was equal to the number of presentations, there was, there were zero, there was zero retention, and some of them said, external clients said, we are not going to buy it. When we said what the product lacks, what to add to the product for it to be useful, we found out that their problems were in a totally different dimension. It's when you come to implement AI, uh, people live with Excel, with all my love to Excel as an old school analyst. And then we decided that we need to improve our presentation even better, even more, and uh, to showcase the uh, functions of our product. It seemed logical. We came up with this online stand using the model and the logic from the product and also key uh, using cool representation of how it, if it was used, it uh, uses scanners, detects the grid from the key points of the face, recognizes the person, uh, shows the speed of your speech, uh, drives, uh, uh, draws uh, graphs and that was such a a cool pro pro product. I was really enjoying it. Let me give you an analogy. It looked like a very complicated thing, really cool technically, but very, very few people would be able to use it. Again, we spent quite a bit of resources from the team for something that we did not want, did not see whether anything, anyone needed that or not. As one of my friends says, we bought experience. Eventually, we are moving to a new dashboard. We uh, want to integrate with BearJazz to reach the mass client, and we began testing within the team one of the ideas to improve efficiency of corporate meetings. As I presented this presentation, I used our system, and in the slide, I, you can see the results of what the system gave me. You can uh, send us a request with your video and also get a similar dashboard with recommendations. We are not finalizing the service yet. Please be our beta testers. Come to us with your ideas and proposals. We'll be really glad. Thanks to this online presentation, we were able to show the system to others. We were able to get the idea of uh, needs and pains of the clients, show them what our technologies were capable of. Another interesting result that we got that's uh, already closer to project management. If at the beginning the team was quite skeptical to this project uh, towards the end, when we saw the real results of our work, the guys from the technical team would come to us with some product-related ideas with features and were inclined to implement them. From the point of view of a project manager, that was a victory. These are our contacts using the QR code. You can send us your videos, uh, whether these are video files or links, and in response we will send you the results of uh, how our system analyzed your presentations. On top of that, if you have any ideas for cooperation, we'll be glad if you write to us. See you. Thank you, Eugene. And uh, our next speaker is Yekaterina Jatko, SBR Project Director. We are going to talk about using AI for our work with contact and how it helps business processes. Yekaterina, the floor is yours. AI 
AI в креативе. AI in creativity, creativity, and I, I quite recently we couldn't even imagine how AI technologies could be used in such a creative sphere as generating content. But today we see that it's quite possible. And today I'm going to tell you about the models that allow us to improve the content, making copyright life easier and allowing us to generate content even if we are no copywriters or no uh, creatives and it's all possible thanks to our AI technology how they all put together in our creator platform it is designed to help us put together efficient texts and reduce uh, reputational legal risks let me show you how we got this idea to put the creator together and the AI model that can improve the content. We used to do it manually. Number of days, number of uh, uh, drafts and operational risks. This is how it used to be. This is how it is today. As we could see from the video, in the past the process of generating content was totally manual. The content managers had to manually put the text together, they had to uh, get those ideas from their own heads, from their own minds uh, in terms of what to focus the client's attention in the text to sell the product better. They had to keep in mind all those legal risks and those drafts to lawyers for approvals, get their comments which increased the time to market for the content production and then you had to purchase uh, images for their content and so on and so forth and now uh, we changed it and approved it and AI is present at every stage of content generation. Let me briefly describe each one of those stages to you. It's a complicated process when we generate content that's how we are organized uh, as a bank we have reputational reputational and legal risks and we need to uh, generate such content that will give us maximum amount of sales uh, giving us additional revenues and now we use AI at every stage, whether it's application for content for our advertising campaign, when the copy is created, when we select uh, images, then we send it for approval, and then when we upload it to the communication channel, again using AI because we select content for every individual client, not to, only to improve sales, but also to make it clear for the user, and most importantly, without irritating them or even perhaps being quite uh, pleasant to them we all we all are quite cautious about advertising advertising that we see we uh, sometimes we are tired of it we don't want to use any of of those 
commercial messages that we get dozens a day from different companies and to remove all those uh, obstacles and doubts of our clients and uh, not to impose anything on them but to also keep our sales up uh, even improving them we select uh, content for individual clients the uh, creative part when we put the text together at the initial briefing stage we uh, generate a text a copy that looks like it was done by a human being it's uh, based on a specific uh, RU GPT-3 technology and the response and feedback from the client uh, even now this is what we have any any employee from the product division can create an application, a request for content showing the requirements, what they really need, what kind of communication they want, and then our AI begins to work. Our model puts the text together. We uh, piloted it about 30 times in 75% of cases the feedback is comparable to the copywriter's product what is written by human beings in 25 percent of cases our model is actually better than the human creatives but we don't stop there and our goal is for the model to work better than creative people and copywriters in most cases here is an example of an AI generated text this campaign was launched by Sber mega market in the push channel thanks to the text uh, generated by the AI model we grew by 17 percent in pushes and also increasing our GMV by 20%, which is also a pretty good result. In terms of AI for images, we don't just use it for copy. Our communication channel is not, are not just SMSs and pushes, but also banners and emails. And even now we can generate images for email uh, layouts. In open sources, so you might seem to have uh, lots of different models that are capable of generating images. How is our model different from open source uh, options as a financial organization we uh, face certain limitations we cannot insert images into our communications which might impact the bank's reputation which may contradict the main visuals of our bank and the overall uh, way of how we need to be presented to the outside world and we have a huge database we keep sending emails to our clients for uh, a dozen years or so and we have a huge database and we know how clients respond to different clients who receive our emails and we know what kind of images may give us more clicks what kind of image can give us additional sales and pushes and conversion we can grow up to five percent in additional pushes by changing the content itself i mean both copy and image and the model here is used for emails and our next step is to train this model to generate smaller images for internet banners and using the data about what kind of banners our clients prefer and the specific Sber pro, uh, group uh, products that they prefer and the, now the legal risk testing model that's another important uh, part of how we generate content we need to make all the approvals and as, as I said before we have to approve our content with lots of different people including the legal department and the legal risks are something that we cannot just uh, ignore and that's why this model of checking uh, legal risks reduces our time to market by about 20 percent and the copywriter or content manager now when they generate their content they can push this check button check for legal risks button and it will highlight the existing risks even with the amounts of fines and the level of risks whether it's high low or middle.
it can help highlight for the copywriter what uh, is there is a risk in the content. Then the content manager can uh, address this before they send uh, the message to legal counsel for clearance. You know, this is done uh, for the lawyers to have a look at a fairly clean text from the legal standpoint. This uh, will help reduce time to market because lawyers in their a turn upon receiving the text for clearance uh, would see the phrases initially highlighted by the model. They see the risks indicated there. They see uh, the possible amount of fines, and uh, the only thing that we are left to do would uh, take a second look at this uh, to, to prove that the model indeed uh, highlighted uh, what should have been highlighted. And uh, the model uh, can train uh, itself. I mean, if lawyers introduce additional risks, then uh, the model learns this and next time it will take this into account when processing a future text. Then uh, there's another model, uh, text toxicity and uh, promo codes uh, checking model. We as a huge uh, institution uh, who interacts with a lot of clients uh, and our client base includes about 100 million individuals uh, nationwide, uh, we um, cannot hurt a person when communicating uh, to him or her. We cannot do something that can cast a shadow on our institution. There were some cases some five years ago uh, when uh, uh, a model, or, no, an algorithm uh, generated individual promo codes. And one of such codes, promo codes, uh, uh, had some indecent meaning. And uh, somehow we missed this because uh, uh, there was no AI uh, check at the time, and uh, as you can understand, uh, it's next to impossible to check manually more than 7 million promo codes per month. Uh, it's next to impossible to identify promo codes that might uh, include some clumsy wording or some inappropriate combinations of uh, letters or numbers. So all the personal promo codes that are sent out to our clients uh, are validated by the toxicity check model. And about 5% uh, of such codes are eliminated, promo codes are eliminated. So we see that uh, the generated promo codes uh, would indeed uh, contain some uh, uh, awkward uh, letter or number combinations. Our next step would be to uh, train the model not just to eliminate toxic combinations or uh, uh, in improper combinations of letters or, or uh, numbers, uh, but rather uh, the model should be able to identify toxicity of topics because uh, we realize that uh, some clients uh, can be very easily hurt uh, in case uh, we word our communication improperly. So the model uh, would consider texts, uh, would highlight uh, risks, reputational risks. If, say, uh, some religious uh, topics uh, are mentioned or political considerations are uh, mentioned something that might hurt our clients. Uh, this is not something we can afford. We cannot afford hurting even one client. This is, uh, is which is unacceptable uh, for us as a client-centered uh, institution. So we have to uh, come up with a uh, the kind of content that would fit uh, precisely in our client. And this is the pinnacle of uh, our content development efforts. Uh, just imagine, we have uh, 10, uh, 100, 1,000 different texts for one product. And uh, an individual of my age, of uh, my gender, uh, very similar in terms of uh, socio-demographic characteristics, could uh, could have this product sold uh, by different means. I mean, we all absorb information differently. For some, for instance, for me, it's important to stress that uh, this is uh, something, this is an action that uh, is valid only today and tomorrow would be too late. Uh, you know, um, even if uh, this uh, action would be valid for two more days, it's important for me to know that I should hurry. Some others uh, are not very happy being prodded to do something, being prodded to make decisions. Instead, for such individual, we should uh, highlight uh, some uh, 
positive financial um, outcomes uh, of using a specific product. So this is uh, what people tend to pay more attention to. Others, uh, uh, if uh, peppered with numbers, uh, would not even care to read through the promo code. So uh, this uh, client-centered approach to content generation, and uh, we move uh, on toward hyper-personalization uh, in our dealing uh, with the clients. Uh, those are messages generated for specific clients, uh, sent out uh, in proper time, using proper channels, uh, using proper formats, using proper language, is something that uh, we focus on. Now, this uh, content a selection model helps identify which text should be sent to which client in order to reduce number of complaints, in order to improve response rate. And uh, this is the kind of model that we've been using uh, fairly aggressively. It adds 3 to 5 percent to uh, CTR or CR. And, uh, you know, we earn additional 300 million rubles per annum uh, thanks to hyper-personalization of our content. Besides, uh, the uh, model, as I said, uh, helps uh, improve uh, CR by 5% and CTR by 3%. I think uh, it's worth mentioning that all our AI uh, instruments do not exist all by themselves. Um, uh, they all uh, exist within one module, within one box, so to speak, creator module. That's a module we use for content clearance. I mean, content manager doesn't have to think where to find those models, how to use those models. He or she would enter the creator module and would start generating content. AI would generate content, then AI would check the content. And then the content manager, as a creative person, uh, would not have to, you know, be savvy uh, with AI technologies, uh, whom to turn to to test promo codes for toxicity. I mean, everything should be done seamlessly in one place. And this is a kind of tool that we offer under creator module. So all the models I mentioned are to be found here in this module. Uh, a uh, content uh, selection and uh, generation module. Anyone entering this module uh, would be in a position to properly generate content. And you don't have to be a copywriter, or a content manager, a creative person. Uh, it is just sufficient to enter the parameters that you want to uh, highlight when dealing with your client. And then the AI would work for you. And, you know, all these solutions introduced into this creator module help reduce the time to market by 50 percent in terms of content generation. Uh, response rates uh, is up 3.6 percent for all products, for all channels, and operational risks are down by 75 percent. Why not 100? Well, because we still have some areas where uh, we can do something manually, and we can introduce something human. Our plans for 2023 are such that we would reduce operational risks by 100%. Now, if you want to learn more about uh, this creator module, or if you want to uh, know more about AI use for content generation and, and content clearance, feel free to turn to us at Spear, and we will give you more detail. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ekaterina. And uh, we move on to the end of our stream. Denis Antikov, head of the NLP Spare Devices uh, Division, will tell us how to build text classifiers uh, that operate well and uh, learn fast. Denis, we are intrigued. Over to you. Hi, everybody. I'm Denis Antikov uh, of Spare Devices. I deal with uh, natural language processing. Now let's talk about how we train strong models and text identification within a very short span of time. Now, our task is as follows. For each uh, query at Smart NLP, we identify a user's uh, intent. 
To achieve this, we have to do classification. A good uh, text classification model are fairly big. They include uh, hundreds of millions and billions of parameters, and it's uh, very difficult and long. It takes a lot of time to train those models. We wanted to be in a position to uh, add uh, new classes, new uh, intentions to model, and roll out uh, those models for production. The question is how to uh, train our strong text classifier and not to spend too much time to achieve this. How to address this task within the optimal time span? Let me start from some uh, simple things. Let me uh, give you the basic model architecture, and then we will talk about some tricks that we employ in order to reduce uh, training time for the model. We're going to talk about uh, distributed learning. We're going to talk about pre-training uh, options. So we're going to talk about model freezing and caching intermediate outcomes. And finally, we'll talk about uh, model stability and uh, freshness control. Now, the basic archi architecture is uh, fairly well known. It's a fairly deep transformer. Some hundreds of millions uh, to billions of parameters. Uh, the current model uh, uses about 400 uh, million parameters. We use Roberta. Uh, we trained Roberta uh, using Cristofari. We employed a lot of uh, public and internal uh, data sets. On top of Roberta, we do mean pooling, we average out embeddings, and um, then we launch the classification head. This is a fairly standard architecture. We train uh, the model on a full uh, data set of about 4 million uh, samples, and it took some 40 hours using one video card. And this is our zero point, or point zero rather, that we uh, use uh, to uh, channel our future efforts. We use um, distributed learning. We use data parallel approach. We add uh, video cards, accelerators, and we can significantly uh, speed up uh, the training process using batches. Well, this helps us to accelerate significantly up to a certain point. For distributed learning, we use DGX with eight uh, video cards, and uh, we use Haravad and uh, NCCL link. Uh, this is something that gives us optimal productivity. We use eight video cards instead of one, and this helps uh, cut the time dramatically from 40 to 10 hours. The next um, idea is as follows. Why don't we uh, train our model to do better embeddings? Uh, well, that's a fairly clear idea. We use the approach. This um, uh, described in metric learning. We uh, use uh, pairs of uh, sentences uh, uh, that are either neutral or, or negative. We use uh, Edward Plus, and we can train the model in such a way so that it can generate better embeddings uh, for offers. Now, a uh, model trained in such a way uh, is much better and uh, can better learn other tasks uh, linked to a sentence level uh, presentations. Now, the, well, I mean, I can dwell on and on about these tasks. In fact, we uh, even came up with an article on this, and uh, feel free to use the QR code to get access to this article. Now, when we uh, use uh, Model checkpoints uh, previously trained on uh, NLE datasets we reduce training time by half, from 10 to 6 hours. And uh, this graph uh, gives you a comparison of the two models. In orange, you see the model that is uh, is there is after pre-training, and a blue is the model that got an LI uh, and pre-trained checkpoint. In other terms, the models coincide perfectly, but uh, the model with the pre-training uh, learn much faster, and uh, and um, the error on the validation data set is much lower. So we reduce the training time from 40 to six hours. Not bad. Uh, let's say we need to. Uh, accelerate even more. What could be done here? Now, the next hack to do is to freeze a part of the model. You know, when training, we can uh, 
structure it in such a way so the gradients uh, would go only through part of the transformer. Or the gradients may stop at the head of electrification uh, without uh, uh, getting into the transformer proper. The idea is to freeze uh, the main part of the model. We don't change the parameters there. And uh, in the course of training, we only change the classification head. And the main model is used just as a uh, source of embeddings. Well, there are some pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages here. As soon as we fix the main model, embeddings for the entire data set can be calculated in advance and put into a cache. Uh, the model doesn't change, the cache wouldn't change either. And uh, when doing our next uh, round of training, there is no need to uh, recalculate, to run everything for the big model, uh, rather just to download everything from a disk. This uh, eliminates 95% of work. I mean, if we launch a new uh, training round, we will have to send only a small part of data sets through our transformer, something that we've not used before. And all the old data sets uh, would be ready and would be recorded on a disk. Now, uh, this may dramatically reduce uh, training time for us because uh, in each training session, 95% of work would have been done. And 95% of data set will be vectorized, and we will have to only retrain the classification head in this case. Uh, you know, as I said, this saves us a lot of time, and uh, this uh, would help us uh, bring the retraining time to 60 minutes. So this would be about vectorizing a small part of the data set, uh, downloading of cache, and retraining of the classification head. This is, this is a very good uh, approach to speed up uh, the training uh, for almost any model. This is true not only for NLP uh, pro models, but also computer vision uh, models and so on. But there are some disadvantages here, and these are as follows. Uh, when you freeze your model, uh, uh, it is no longer in a position to adapt to the data changes uh, that inevitably happen when uh, you do uh, the service production. The nature of uh, queries change, and in order to maintain high quality, well, you have to keep your model fairly fresh. You have to update the weights uh, based on the changed data. Now, when the model is frozen, uh, you cannot do that. In order to maintain the maximum possible quality, you have to keep your model fairly, fairly fresh. You have to retrain the model end to end, uh, taking into account new data that uh, come at the production stage. We know how to do this. Uh, in uh, equal time spans, uh, you do your uh, trainings again. But uh, if you keep changing your basic classification model, uh, predictions uh, distribution might change uh, for your classes. Say you added new classes, uh, you want the model to work uh, for old classes just like it used to, but uh, in order to do this uh, for n plus 1, we introduce error function. Uh, which uh, is responsible for consistency of the new model versus the old one. Uh, this uh, helps maintain continuity of uh, the new model version with respect to the old version. Now, this, when we roll out a new model, helps us to keep uh, the quality of predictions, and uh, we are fairly safe to launch the new version without uh, being concerned that uh, the model behavior at production stage would change. This is the most important point. I mean, when you, when you have huge traffic, uh, normally you would not want to introduce major changes into how this traffic is routed uh, through your system. So my, my model stability uh, with big traffic is an important thing that uh, have to be monitored. Now, uh, basic implementation uh, using multi-GPU uh, training uh, took 12 hours. If we introduce uh, NLI checkpoints, uh, then we will have six hours for training. And finally, when uh, we freeze our model and we, when we cache intermediate vectors and embeddings and only train the classification head, then uh, we do our training within one hour, depending on the size of the data set. So basically, this helps us uh, to dramatically uh, 
uh, either by one order or two orders of magnitude to uh, reduce time uh, for our training. Thank you very much. This is it. Come to talk to our teams and uh, to our recruiters. And uh, all the best to you. Bye. Denise, thanks a lot. Our program will conclude uh, by uh, Valentina Kributina, product owner, and Valery Tinovsky uh, from R&D and LP's Bear Device. We're going to learn about uh, one of uh, the uh, machine learning approaches and the interocular composition. Hello, everybody. I'm Valentina Klebutina. I'm product owner of the uh, interlocutor product. And together with Valeria Ternoxky, we're going to talk about uh, our Sobia Sidnik product, one kind of models we use. Uh, our presentation will comprise two parts. We'll talk about the product part, and Valeria will talk about the model. As you may know, Sper has a family of uh, salute. Uh, uh, Entities, uh, Spear, Afina, and Joy, uh, they all have uh, different approaches. They respond to uh, different uh, to the same queries differently, and they all have their own unique voices. Under the hood, uh, we have a number of uh, components. Well, obviously, we use the retrieval approach when we uh, search for the most uh, relevant answer. We have some generative uh, uh, models, and we have scenario engine uh, when we want to bring the user uh, via a certain uh, path. Now, we move toward uh, memory, empathy, and we do a lot of experiments. A few words about personalization and memory. Now, we use the data that the user uh, provides us with in a dialogue. If, say, a user tells us that he or she has a daughter named Elena of uh, five years, we can use this information in a further dialogue. We also have tools that allow us to identify users' interests uh, on a hunch. If, say, a user uh, loves to talk about cars, we detect this, and in the future, we can uh, offer uh, such user dialogues uh, that would have cars as a main topic. We will not be talking about knitting or we will not be talking about pets. We will be talking about only cars. Besides, um, there is some information that users provide us with uh, when they register, such as age, uh, gender, name. and. Uh, this screen uh, gives you an idea of the information that users provide us with uh, in a dialogue, something we will be using in a couple of days. The next uh, area is empathy. Users very, some, pretty often come to us and share with us their concerns. Uh, um, uh, they look for support. They share with us their misgivings and so on. So when we see this uh, in our logs, uh, we would uh, consider this. We came up with a number of empathy scenarios. We worked on those with uh, psychologists. So we came up with different uh, techniques, and we see some response uh, from users now. We also use uh, we plan to employ so-called smart sensor to understand whether a word uh, is just an expression or a curse, uh, because very often users employ even four-letter words uh, as expression, a means of expression, uh, just uh, something to manifest their uh, emotion, not so much uh, to uh, use it as an obscenity. Well, sometimes we're accused of the virtual system not being uh, intelligent enough. You know, this uh, helps us to identify some uh, possible future growth areas. Besides, uh, your interlocutor, your participant on conversation, can uh, guide you as to what to look at and how to use your time. So we um, use uh, some uh, uh, soft uh, prodding techniques to direct 
uh, users uh, to uh, some desired topics. Uh, for instance, uh, if we know that a user has kids, then we would uh, gradually, step by step, uh, bring the user to a discussion of whether he or she bought everything that would be needed for school, because the academic year uh, was about to start. And we would switch conversation to uh, desired topics. We also support uh, situation activities that relate to some events or uh, holidays. Uh, for instance, we did a quiz uh, that we did uh, to celebrate the birthday of uh, a Russian rock star. And, uh, you know, uh, that was a good story in terms of metrics. This scenario proved very popular with our users. Now, to finalize, uh, what this uh, Sabesednik or interlocutor uh, product is all about, you know, this is your friend that would support you uh, in any situation and would behave depending on your emotional state. If uh, you feel good, you can share your joy. If uh, you are blue, you can share your uh, concern and grief with this interlocutor. Uh, but uh, you know, very often users come to us and they don't know uh, what they need and uh, what to talk about. So our interlocutor or sub will help them identify a topic. And um, uh, this product uses unique uh, interaction uh, approaches for different um, customers, different clients. In addition, uh, if uh, you uh, used pre-recorded uh, telephone message, you would know that uh, there are some features uh, that would uh, do automatic uh, calls to users. We came up with a pool of dialogues to support just this, and this story proved uh, fairly successful. Now let me invite a colleague of mine, Valery Ternovsky, who will tell you about uh, the retrieval models and uh, generative models. Hi, everybody. I'm Valery Ternovsky. I'm team leader of uh, R&D uh, team for the sub or interlocutor product. I'm going to talk about some technical aspects of uh, training our wonderful models under the sub project. Let's start with the retrieval model. Uh, this is a fairly good, stable system, allowing us to select uh, dialogue uh, answers or responses uh, from uh, response bank. For this model, we use uh, Ross Berta, uh, large uh, version. Uh, there are some parameters here that we used uh, to train it. Uh, the frameworks we employ, Haravad Multi-GPU, for instance, uh, with matrix that help improve quality. And, uh, we have a fully fledged multitask here. Rosperta uh, gets trained uh, based on several uh, tasks, and uh, it works pretty well for NLP, for the model sees not only dialogue data, but also it learns uh, to classify uh, some uh, text components or do markups for the text, uh, learns how to rank texts, uh, learns to identify toxic comments, and so on. Uh, and these are components of our core model. As I mentioned, we have metric learning. Uh, this is uh, the use of uh, fully fledged batching to improve uh, uh, speed. Uh, uh, this is distillation to improve uh, quality with the use of a heavier model. Uh, this, is, this was used to train a lighter model to obtain better quality. And finally, adversarial attacks to improve uh, resilience uh, for um, you know, uh, any message entering our assistance uh, might differ dramatically in terms of quality and uh, uh, compilation. Now, reinforcement learning for NLP tasks is uh, something that uh, is very much talked about. Uh, besides, it's not something that uh, you can address successfully all the time, and the approaches would differ depending on the model you use. For a travel, uh, as you can see from the slide, use a module where each context or each query uh, is uh, linked to an answer and goes through a critic uh, model. And then we use uh, adaptive uh, soft loss to add the knowledge on the markup of specific dialogues for the ultimate uh, uh, training function. Now, this allows us to better structure uh, vectors of good or bad dialogues uh, versus uh, queries. So we provide uh, a good uh, 
visible boundary between good and bad uh, dialogues. And this helps us improve uh, quality metrics for our retrieval model given the specific generation of the production stage. Now, in terms of generative model, uh, this model by nature differs uh, from retrieval model. And here we do not select any um, responses or answers from a bank. This is something that we produce on a hunch. We use uh, GPT-3. And uh, perhaps a few words on how we adopted this uh, to generate dialogues. As many of you would know, auto regression models, uh, generative models, are not designed to do this. They were trained using huge sequences. They are ready to generate rather long text from the box, but to adjust our model to the generation of short dialogues, we put together a special gold data set for training, which was the editorial version of short dialogues when we using real editors, human editors, we were writing dialogues in the style for our model, and then we modify embeddings and tokenizer to separate the speakers within a specific dialogue, and then we use such a trick as they use in Berta. Instead of negative examples, though, we use really generated candidates using the previous generation of the model, and the practice has shown us, life has shown us, that this approach really works well in terms of quality. These are some of our training parameters, three stages, pre-training using the huge uh, corp of uh, Russian uh, language, then uh, using books, the automated uh, set, and then the golden data set. Everywhere parameters are different, somewhat different. We have had to select those hyper parameters using trial and error method. That's what we always have to use using to, or moving on to offline RL mod module. Let me uh, mention a couple of steps here to use reinforcement learning as part of generative model. We need data, we need dialogue, whether in production or elsewhere. Then we need the critic model to determine whether those dialogues were good or bad, and if they were good, how good they were to send them to together with some kind of algorithm for fine-tuning, and then we need an algorithm to update our policy. Now we use proximal policy optimization, PPO, also, also offered by the authors of the original GPT-3 and three other approaches that we experiment with actively. As for data, as always in machine learning, it's a, a critical topic for our offline RL module we use two entities, of course, live dialogues from our production and our know-how. These are dialogue when from the, when from the so-called self-chat arena, we take them when we clash different models from different generations and the models talk to one another on different topics and that's a separate topic. We also had a huge study there. And then we use the critic model to label all those uh, uh, dialogues and then we use PPO and batch RL style. That's how we get unlimited potential of data available for training after stage one. Our models were good enough to have dialogue in the planned uh, topics without making too many mistakes. And then we have stable growth of quality metrics by shares of percentage points after each iteration. Then uh, with unlimited number of iterations, we could do it for quite a while. Uh, and now, briefly, that's it. We have these special approaches to retrieval and gen generative model. We didn't mention all the details. We will disclose them at our event on the 30th of November. Salute all AI Day. Come to uh, talk to our teams from spare devices. There will be lots of uh, R&D and other topics. Uh, and you can check our web chat. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Valentina and Valeri. And actually, our stream is over. I'd like to thank all the speakers for the interesting uh, topics and great presentations. I'd like to thank our audience for their attention.